bug like crawled up and like was like investigating for like what the fuck is this? Oh, I just realized I'm not muted. Look at that. How's it going? Oh, let's turn that ish way, way down. How down is that? Still not fully down. What's up? How we doing? <laughs> she. Oh, Daggerheart is kind of stealing the show a little bit. Um, I'd be very good at not voting over on Twitch as well. I would like a cookie. <laughs> Look, I look, I'm this is uh this is your um classic uh what do you call it? This is the I'm not even running a poll on Twitch. And um and you know what's up. You know what's up with that. Uh if I go to critical role watch. No, dang it, it's not doing it. No. All of my automatic captures have become not so automatic, strangely enough. So I have to kind of like relink them, which is normally what I'm taking the the beginning time for. But I will tell you all, I will tell you all, if you have truffle, the uh, the chat that combines. I'm just gonna turn that off. If you have truffle, the chat that or the the program that combines both of the chats, there is just a singular poll. So you can you can vote for whatever you want. BG3 did not get any love, so I thought I would split the vote a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but you can uh, I'm I'm not even running a, a poll on on Twitch currently. But if you're on Twitch and you have Truffle, you could be voting in the poll. 
But it does look like Kukuro was a good suggestion, Tai Tai. I do li- I did like Kukuro a lot. Um, but it, it does not seem nearly as popular as uh, as the dagger. As the old as ye old dagger. There's a poll on Twitch, but it only has three options. Oh, that's very odd. What? Oh, 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 oh. I see, I see, I see. You made you made the poll. I got you. I got you, Mustang. Um, still seeing two different polls. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. I didn't realize Mustang had made a poll. That's fair. Let's see. Uh can you see my chat? Hello. I can. I was I was paying attention to it for a second and then stopped. Um Okay, so okay, Daggerheart got two and Minecraft got two over here. So Working that into the total results, it looks like a seven to five situation. So it looks like, according to democracy, <laughs> Daggerheart still wins out. Mm. Gotcha, Mustang. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, Okie dokie, then. Hey, I am. I am a man of the people. If uh, if I am anything, so let's do some prep. Get that out of here. Uh, oh wait, you can still see it. Lol. Uh, I keep I keep forgetting. I just need to go back to screen captures because honestly, the Windows captures. I forget that it is uh you know capturing my entire window and so then i'll just try to move it off and uh that does not work oh wait i realized you guys can't even see what i'm doing because i'm using studio mode man i'm a professional okay well i just realized i was showing you the uh i was showing you the the behind the scenes earlier and i'm now realizing that none of you could uh see it but you know that's okay (laughs) we have ended the poll we've ended the poll Daggerheart appears to have taken it, and uh, we will... Oh, wait, I can't end this one. Well, poll is ended, and I guess this is also uh, encouragement, I guess, to uh, get in get in early. Get in early on, uh, on this ish. Let's see. Okay, yeah. So... Daggerheart. I legitimately couldn't decide because I was like, I kind of want to do all three of these. And then Tai Tai brought up um, uh, Kukuro, and I was like, I also want to play Kukuro again. Um, <laughs> so I am, I am very happy to be doing any of the above. So Daggercraft Mineheart. <laughs> yeah, we can make it happen. We can make it work. Um, Let's see. All right, all right, all right. Quick start adventure. So I read over this a little bit. I did not look at any of the... um... Oh, I also got three confirmed. I got three confirmed. I am not... I'm not I'm not entirely sure if I'm going to do uh, four yet, but I think... I think I'm going to do... I'm going to do three. I think, uh, I think I'm going to do three. So I got three uh, confirmed for Daggerheart. Now, I, I'm still not going to say names because we have not tried to actually plan a date yet. And as we all know, that could be the hardest part of getting a TTRPG session actually running. Um, <laughs> so I don't want to name and then uh, inadvertently shame someone for not being able to da- make dates work. Um, so... We're we're gonna be hopefully uh, on on our on our very near way. The outcome is still one that will be most enjoyable. Congratulations to my opponent. Hell yeah, hell yes. And okay, and the whiteboard is working. Let me just make it a little bit smaller, and I'm gonna put it over there. And I need to get some music rolling because I'm not used to like needing, needing music, but when it's so quiet or when there's nothing, you know, going on in the background, uh, slobs. Boop. Oh, that was way too loud and then way too quiet. There we go. Um, 
All right. Do 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 do. If you are any of the people playing uh, in my Daggerheart session, don't watch. Don't do it. Daggerheart GM prep. And we'll probably be doing a decent amount of the prepping in there. Um, so. Introduction. Oh, that's a little loud. Should probably rename the stream. Yes. True. Correct. Accurate. I totally forgot about that. Uh, prepping for my first... Or, uh, GM prep for Daggerheart. Nothing fancy. I'll, I'll come up with a fancier title later, but just something to, uh, to get the folks in here. There we go. And save. And done. There we go. I got a Poke Bowl. Hell yeah. I'm not a big seafood guy. But people do seem to like poke quite a bit. So I've considered it. <laughs> I have considered it. Get out of here. Uh, okay. Character packet. So it does recommend these uh, characters. I, th I have a distinct feeling that people will... The, the people that I will be playing with will want to make their own. I, uh, that, that is, for some reason, I, I get that feeling. So, I'm not going to spend too much time looking at that. What we are going to do, wait, is look through all of the introductions. So, basically, past the characters. Because I want to get a total package. I very briefly reviewed this. Um, and I've been kind of thinking about some some things related to it but we'll see uh my opinion changes at all after looking at it in more detail so if you're here you're probably about to run the sablewood messengers quick start adventure for your players whether you've run num numerous rpgs in the past or this is your first time taking on the gm role will lead you through everything you need to know to have a successful first session of daggerheart it is recommended that you read the entire guide before beginning. You also want to get out all the Sablewood Messenger's standees and gather 10 tokens you can utilize to represent fear during the game. I do like, I saw this in the PDF, uh, that they have, oh wait, where are they? Are they at the very end? What? Are they in the credits? I noticed in the, um, in the PDF that they had a bunch of standee figures. I guess they don't have them in here. They have them in, oh wait, standees in terrain number one. Aha, there they are. So I thought this was kind of neat. They include a bunch of stuff that you can like print out for your actual game. I thought that was cool. The only thing I'm a little worried about so far is that it does seem like a lot of stuff. Like I was reading more about the ranges and, you know, some of the abilities and I, and especially the action tracker. One thing that. I, when I was reading more about it that um, did catch my eye about the action tracker that I was like, oh, yeah, that's that's fair, is that it is one of its purposes is that everyone has a unique token type that they contribute to the action tracker, right? So it's not just like there's like a pool of like, I don't know, 12 general tokens there's going to be, like, three tokens from AKL. There's going to be seven tokens from Wired Jeweler. There's going to be, I don't know, zero tokens from Tai Tai. I mean, he is uh, the shy guy. So part of, and I, and I remember uh, Soya talking about kind of the, the my tokens, no, um, Soya talking about how she was somewhat uh, worried about, you know, the the shyer people, the quieter people, kind of getting steamrolled throughout combat. 
And they do sort of address that within the action tracker section, where they basically say, if you have one person, ugh, wired jeweler, what are you doing? Uh, <laughs> kind of taking up all of the actions and air in the room. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but if there's a, you know, a really big differential between these two, as a GM, you might want to focus, you know, the next plot development or the next question to clarify the scene on Tai Tai so that maybe they have some opportunity to contribute some tokens from their big old stack. Um, and after reading that, I was like, you know, that is a decent point. I am... I would say I'm not I wouldn't say I'm worried about how to track it. I think the general way that I'm going to track it is I'm just going to essentially have a slot on the action tracker for each of my players and I'll literally do it how I just represented it on here where we just have a number in there that updates every time they contribute. I think it's a little bit more cumbersome, but I will say a lot of the system seems very built for in-person play. So I'm, I'm interested to see how existing VTTs handle it if they, you know, re release it. I don't know if they have any plans to release their own or anything along those lines. But um, I saw a good suggestion for tracking those for GM remotely on paper. List names by each make a slash every time they take an action. When you use the GM, uh, turn it into an X. Oh, yeah, that works. That works. So essentially, on your GM side, although you would kind of want to have it, part of the recommendation is to have it visible to all players, but that still works. You know, you could have, like I said, AKL, Wired Jeweler, and Tai Tai. So every time AKL takes an action, I make a little slash, slash, slash. And then when I use up the token, I go X, X, X. Honestly, to a degree, this actually kind of is more representative of who is acting and who is not because with the token situation, if AKL, you know, contributes three tokens, Wired Jeweler contributes one and Tai Tai contributes, we'll reverse it this time. Tai Tai just contributes so many. And then I take them out of the pool and I take a bunch of tie ties. I guess the point is that you should try to take them evenly. But what if I want to take, as the DM, I want to take like seven. You know, that means that I'll have to take all of AKL and Wire Jewelers. And I won't even be able to take all of tie ties. So the slash method, you know, of making like slash, 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 slash. This will, even as I use them it will still be representative of who has done a lot of acting throughout the session uh, and, and potentially be a good reference point for me as a GM. I'm still not entirely sure how I feel about it. I'll have to see how it bears out in practice, but it's certainly interesting. It is certainly interesting. I'm feeling less negative about it and much more neutral the more I look. Some people are also making VTT stuff. I'm not. I am not surprised. I am not surprised. Uh, I also just like the idea that you can use your tokens to add to your character's aesthetic. I'm an aesthetics person. That's fair. Like having specialized dice, specialized tokens. That's fair. That's totally fair. <laughs> I guess I'll share a couple. Um, but that one doesn't differentiate between players if you want to keep an idea of who's being more active. Yeah, yeah. The slash method is interesting. I was thinking tallies, but dashes and then making them X's is pretty cool. Yeah, I agree. Do players have a certain number of tokens they can contribute? No, there's no, to my understanding at least, there's no maximum. Um, there's no, there's no like generalized maximum. It's just like you just put them in every time you do something. Um, which I think is, like, generally good. It's just, uh, you know, there's there's a bit of... I don't even want to say tension. It's just something I'm going to kind of have to rework my brain around, you know? Um, anyways. Character packet. After they receive their character packet... Oh, wait. We don't care. 
<laughs> we don't care because uh, we're not using these. So the Sable Lord. As your players look over the first page of their character packet, take a moment to read through the Sablewood summary to familiarize yourself with the setting of this adventure. I think that's incredibly important. I like settings. The Sablewood is a region in the core rulebook designed for level one characters. So when you finish this adventure, you can easily continue the story by exploring additional areas of the forest. Sablewood. Does it take us there? Nice. Tier zero. You know... I like them splitting all of their stuff into these different tiers. I think it makes it a lot easier to run, honestly. Like, I I really, I'm a big fan of, um, in general, I'm a big fan of default settings. But even, like, Blades' is default setting, it sort of has tiered areas, but only sort of it's very shaky on like what it like what the actual like tier means um and i i like this sort of distinction of like we're going to have these differently like areas of different danger levels and obviously you could go and progressively make the sablewood more dangerous or you could make another area less dangerous but i like for there to be a distinct framework to where the DM doesn't need to do that work if they don't want to, right? Like, as a DM, if I just need to pull something out, I can look at what tier my players are, I can look for a setting that is that tier, and I can just know that without any work on my end, if I'm running late, if my time is short for prep, I can just pull it out and know that it'll be relatively on balance um and i like that you know that that obviously exists in dm for monsters with cr uh but i like that it also exists for these generalized settings environments you can work in the traps and the fauna and the flora into all of that um i like that i like that a lot so can I open new link? I can indeed. All right. Should we read over the Sablewood now? There's a fucking lot. There's a lot to the Sablewood. Is this all Sablewood? Holy shit. No. Rhyme of the Colossi is, 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 okay. Eligator Strixwolf. Okay, I know that Strixwolves are from later in the adventure. But man, so that goes for a fucking while. Look at the look at the bar on the right side. That is a lot of sablewood. That's crazy. And the action track is only recommended for when it feels necessary, not every instance of combat, but it could also be used outside of combat by the same principle. My understanding of the action tracker is that it should be used any time that a challenge will require a lot of rolls to overcome. So there's a, in the quick start, the first kind of beat of the of the quick start is, uh, la, 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 where is it? Teaching the game, teaching the game, save wood messengers. Yeah, so this act one, this first beat is the merchant current. And they do not recommend taking out the uh, action tracker during this, even though there is a possibility that you fight the Strix Wolf. But they do recommend taking it out for Thicket Thieves, which is where there's like four combatants and they have more health and they have like distinct moves. So that is that is very much. It seems like there, and it seems like you could do the same thing for social challenges. In fact. I was looking more into uh, the adversaries. Where are the adversaries? Adversaries. You can use an action tracker for skill challenges too, I guess. Absolutely. In fact, you even have... Uh, uh, so they have all of their adversaries have different types, I recognized. Or I didn't recognize. They put in there. Um, <laughs> and there are certain uh, adversary types that are like primarily not um 
combat challenges. So like they have these social adversary types, courtier, merchant, petty noble. So when you look at the courtier stat block, yes, they still have all of these attack stuff, but their moves are are primarily like non-combat related. They do stress damage. Um, they can spend a fear to convince a target or crowd that, or notable individual that one person or a group is responsible for some problem facing the target. So there are very much um, social people. I would honestly like to see... A, and I think that part of, part of what I'm about to say is, is um, sort of accomplished within this uh this location summary but something that i would really like to see i don't need for you know every single person to have this but here i mean i'm gonna bring up dnd beyond to kind of illustrate something uh monster manual eric cockra so eric cockras have a stat block a stat block in D&D is almost always primarily for the purpose of running them in combat. Even if the thing that you are, you know, looking to run is maybe not necessarily explicitly uh, combat oriented. Something like the, uh, the flump, right? Where is the flump? Flumps are specifically not like, they, they are lawful good. They do not want to fight you. However, they have primarily things that will be utilized within combat. Um, advanced telepathy and telepathic shroud don't, but everything else is primarily that. And then they have these, uh, these text blocks, right? I would really like to see something within these adversaries, right? I would like to see... I, I very much understand why they have, you know, these social types, whereas, you know, the tiny red ooze is not, you know, doesn't have any social abilities. But for things where it makes sense, like the Outer Realms Corrupter, I would like to see a move or just some aspect of this adversary that goes towards combat, social and exploration uh or potentially something that hits on both of those things at once um so like i think that that mockery and scapegoat are both very good like social hits um but i'd like to see something about like the environment that you might find them in their fucking if they're if they're like a strix wolf right if they're like a strix wolf it's like the type of oh there we go I, uh, okay. Dude, this is hilarious. This is exactly what I wanted. This is exact I would like this, and I think this might be because they are they are within the starter uh adventure. I I would really love to see kind of exactly this. Um where like the Strix Wolf Yes, has its daggers, it has its pack tactics, it has its flying, but it also has, like, potential social stuff, and more specifically, it has very environment-focused lore. Because I think one of the problems that I often have with D&D &D stat block entries is that sometimes they give you environment type stuff like the Fomorans giants of the underdark. I think that's cool. It's like they dwell in the eerily beautiful caverns of the underdark, rarely adventuring to their surface. Their layers feature abundant access to water, fish, mushroom forests. Like these are all recommendations that DMs can use to place the Fomorans to do tracking challenges, to talk about, their layers and their ecosystems but most monsters in the dmg do not have or in the monster mail don't have this and this is rarely worked into this right this is rarely mechanicized 
and I like the Strix Wolves. The Strix Wolves, uh, they hunt in packs, equally fast on land and in air. Their heads can turn to 70, which give them impeccable tracking abilities. This is all mechanicized within powerful senses. They ignore the hidden condition on anyone within close range. I, I, I like this. I want to see more of this within our adversaries. What the heck? Oh my gosh, my lamp is like flickering. That was really distracting for me. Um, I, yeah, I want to see more and more of this. I think that'd be really cool. Um, you never know when players will adopt a Clarota. Absolutely. Absolutely you don't. Uh, and so like on the, on the flip side, right, these are, let's see, the fails a social action, must pay one more handful of gold. That's hilarious. See, this is exactly the sort of social stuff that I'm looking for. This, uh, this preferential treatment. Succeed on a social action against the merchant, gains a discount on purchases. If they fail, they pay one more handful of gold. Love that. Absolutely love this preferential treatment. And I understand that for something like a merchant or a courtier that's like very generic, you may not need or want to put in environment type stuff. But I, and for the Strix Wolf, it may not be super feasible to put in like social stuff for the Strix Wolf. Um, but I like these two aspects. I want more than just what their fucking, you know, melee daggers do. You know what I'm saying? I want, I want more than for these adversary stack blocks to just be combat oriented. Uh, even though. Even though Daggerheart is explicitly a combat-oriented system, I want a little bit more. Is the list monster motivations in their stat block, especially if that motivation isn't kill the player? Yeah, absolutely. And you know what's interesting is within this, so if I go to um, Thicket Thieves, because I read some of this. Uh, it talks about, or maybe it talks about it. No. Does it talk about it earlier? Thicket Thieves, One Last Snarl, First Action Roll. Do, 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 do. Where do they talk about it? At one point, they talk about Thistle Folk. Um, there's the Thistle Folk Ambusher. Do, 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 do. Ambush. See them coming. Thistle Folk's goal. There we go. So this specific adventure lists the Thistle Folk's goal. Like, it, it is very explicit on what they want to do. Um, and it's kind of weird. Some of this um, some of this is a little bit different than the PDF itself. Because in the PDF, there's a little uh, call-out box that specifically talks about how most thistle folk are not thieves and like <laughs> it like actually goes to characterize the thistle folk a lot. Oh, there it is. About the thistle folk. The thistle folk take up residence in a place where nobody else dares within the thickest thorny bramble. So it goes towards some of that, but to be fair, this is within a quick start adventure. So, I absolutely agree. Um Uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I got distracted by chat. Um, I absolutely agree that I would like to see more stuff directly built into the stat block. Like, a lot of this is interesting lore. It's interesting history. But I want it to be directed and more consistent. A lot of this is just historical stuff that you are then meant to derive how they should act, what their stuff should look like. Like, the, the fairy dragon just has, like, these three basically features of its uh, mentality, but it doesn't talk about its typical environment. It doesn't talk about its, uh, its typical motivations. All it does is talk about how it wants to play pranks, which is... I mean, it's it's fine, but I would like to see uh, it, it a little bit more point by point of like 
for every monster there is this thing for every adversary there is this thing you know um and especially because in Die Hard, every player can choose not to die and take a scar instead. Having a set win condition enemies have if the party TPKs is a great idea. True. I agree. In principle, that mechanic could make shopping slightly less painful for someone who finds it boring when it's all RP-based. Absolutely, AKL. No, I don't think that's stretching at all. The um, you, You're talking about the, um, the, the merchant's mechanic? I think the merchant's mechanic is fucking awesome. I think that's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember, if I remember correctly, I recall seeing them at the top of some adversaries in the core playtest. Yeah. The layout is a bit different, more confusing for me on Demiplane TBH, but that may just be because I'm not used to it. It's a little bit easier to navigate on, on Demiplane, like, like literally navigate, like the, the hyperlinks linking is a little bit better. And I like um, that I can like open things up from like this. So, you know, if I'm confused on an action roll, I can pop that out. But I agree that the the actual layout itself is a little bit more confusing. Um, anyways, I like where they're going with adversaries. I like it a lot, and I want I absolutely want to see more of this sort of thing. Like uh, this deck card. Let's see, bladed guards. Marcus tries to make an attack roll. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to see a little bit more of this, which, to be fair, at the top of all of these, we have motives and tactics, which are sort of like the make it through the day is sort of what we're talking about. And maybe I just need to kind of reformat my mind within the experiences uh, stuff. Like, these motives and tactics are very reminiscent of the experiences. And to be fair... That could absolutely go after what I am wanting, you know? Like, their motives and tactics are arrest, close gates, pin down, and make it through the day. Uh, let's go back to the Strix Wolf. Let's go back to the Strix Wolf. Uh, z -z 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 -z. The Strix Wolf is stalk, surround, protect, pack. Like, these are sort of, sort of generalized stuff that can lead you in that direction and i like these sorts of things but i don't know i'm wanting a little bit more the adversaries like i like some of it i like this i like uh this merchant preferential treatment a lot i want a little bit more on each adversary especially when there's relatively few i'm not saying that there's like you know there there is there's quite a lot but on, you know, the relative of, like, what we're used to in something like the Monster Manual, it's not that many. I'm not seeing the menu links on the left. Maybe I'm in the wrong place on Demiplane? Maybe. So, I'm in Quick Start Adventure, so I went to Library, and then Quick Start Adventure, and then View Source. That is how I got there. And then, yeah, mine's just, mine's just on the left. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. And I think to tie it all off, I, I'm looking, I'm hoping for some consistency. So I like that all of the adversaries have this motives and tactics at the top. I would like to th for those to be a little bit buffed out. But overall, I, I, want, it, I want it consistent. Uh, teaching the game. No, 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 no. Sablewood. Sablewood? It's all mechanical overviews. Sablewood messengers. Okay. So let's start at the merchant cart. Read the following aloud. Ah, you zoomed out. Screen size width issue. That makes sense. That does make sense. Um, all right. This evening, your uh, let, let's give me <clears throat> let me get my DM voice on. I'm trying to think of how I want to read this because the Sablewood is very interesting from what I've seen so far. It's very you know what? Let's read about the Sablewood because I actually think I actually do think that the Sablewood itself is kind of the star of the show in this intro from what I've seen. 
Like, a lot of this intro is meant to introduce the facets of the Sablewood more than anything else. So let's see. Summary. The Sablewood is a seemingly endless forest of dark trees that reach hundreds of feet towards the sky some. Oh, <laughs> towards the sky some. Towards the sky. Some say they have been here since the time before the Forgotten Gods. It's famous for its unique hybrid animals, like lemur toads, tiger elk, elk, as well as the well-worn trade routes populated by traveling merchants. The hybrid animals in this place range from completely docile to extremely vicious. A cat squirrel might come and feed gently from your hand, while an alligator would launch itself out of a nearby river to snap you up as an easy meal. Within the Sablewood, there is a small, friendly village known as Hush, the PC's destination during this adventure. There are no inns in Hush. Any travelers passing through are treated as honored guests and invited to stay in the home of a member of the community. Many people in Hush, and the Sablewood at large, still worship the Forgotten Gods, despite having no names by which to call them. The Whitefire Arcanist is the leader of Hush's primary religious order and maintains the magic wards that protect the village. All right. Yeah, the location is a character, not just a random place. Absolutely. It, it, well, and from what I've seen... The beats of Sablewood Messenger, the merchant cart, is meant to introduce us to the hybrid animals. The thicket thieves are is meant to introduce us to the more sentient threats. Seeking an arcanist is meant to introduce us to Hush. The treehouse is meant to introduce us to these wacky and wild and powerful people that live in the Sablewood and how they go about managing that. And Ward Renewal is meant to introduce us to the deep and terrifying magics that inhabit the Sablewood. That has been my, my impression so far. So it seems like the Sablewood is the thing that I really need to focus on when I am doing my narrations, when I am thinking about new things to introduce. I should focus myself not on any of these individual facets, but on the Sablewood as a whole. Uh, which is an important fantasy fantasy marker. Yeah, no, absolutely, Akale. I agree. Skysome. Stealing Skysome as a descriptor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's perfect. That is perfect. Uh, let's see. The Merchant Cart. These animals are very Atla. Very Atla. Very, very. Very, very Adla. Yeah, absolutely. Dragon turtles, fucking badger moles, yeah. All right, read the following aloud. Let's get the <clears throat> the DM voice. I don't actually have a real DM voice, but I'll get one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this evening, your party finally made it to the Sablewood, a sprawling forest of colossal trees. Some say are even older than the Forgotten Gods. It's a place renowned for two things. It's sunken pathways that provide trade routes for many traveling merchants. And it's okay. Wait, we already read this. Wait a second. This was the summary. <laughs> okay. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, uh, no. Oh, we almost got to the end where it wasn't the summary anymore. Okay. And it's unique hybrid animals. Even now from within the carriage, you can hear strange sounds. The bird calls of the lark moths, the croak of the lemur toads, and the skittering of a family of fox bats in the underbrush. One of you is driving the carriage. Who is it? This is something that I noticed, and we'll immediately do it again, where they mention it during the like GM principles, the flow of the game, that the GM is supposed to ask questions, uh, clarifying questions back to the players. And in my head, I was when I read that, I was like, yeah, that's like good clarifiers about like what the players are doing. What like how they are interacting with the scene. Reading this, it is much more like collaborative storytelling vibe of like they want the players to like define things about the world, which is interesting. It's interesting. I'll have to... It's going to be something that I will feel very awkward doing a lot of the time. And, you know, you can probably do it more or less depending on your vibe. Um, but they recommend it multiple times throughout this. 
As an infant, really more like fetal, GM, I appreciate the very step-by-step -step instructions here. Easy to modify, of course, but for those of us who need guardrails, they're here. Absolutely. This entire, from what I have seen, this is very beat, uh, bloop. beat, 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 beat. Like, boom, 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 boom. Which they, I mean, that's literally how they describe it. Um, you know, within the, within the overview, but, and so that's kind of what I want to do here today for myself is look at those beats and look at where I can maybe look at expanding them a little bit, maybe look at, uh, some alternative approaches. Um, but yeah, I absolutely agree that I like the step-by-step -step nature of it and, uh, and and I can, you know, look at modifying it because I have more experience. But it's very, very nice for beginning DMs. Um, so, when a player volunteers their character as the carriage driver, you can ask them a question like, You've noticed something unique about the look of the trees here in the Sablewood. What is it? That is very much like, hey, world build really quick for me. You know? Which is very interesting. It's very interesting. I've been thinking about... I was thinking last night about like how I would actually go about doing that sort of thing. Uh, and I think that I would have maybe more personalized questions. So there's one later during Seeking an Arcanist. Um, la, 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 la. Yeah, there we go. So when talking about the Clover Tavern... One of the questions is, how does the second floor of this tavern look so wildly different than the first? What smell permeates the air throughout this place? What unique custom do the locals seem to participate in every time you walk in the room? This is like very direct, hey, players, please world build. I did have a thought that something that might be more comfortable for me personally is phrasing the questions more like, Something about this place reminds you of home. What is it? Like, I want to engage the... Because I think that players are going to be used to world building and describing their backstories, especially if they come from something like D&D. But I don't think that they will be very used to the idea of world building the world around them. Like, I feel like if I asked my D&D group, how does this uh, second floor look so wildly different than the first? I feel like they would be like, I don't know. How, how does it? Like, <laughs> they're so used to, like, you know, me describing the shit. But if I say, hey, uh, blah, blah, blah. Hey, Zenshi, the second floor of this tavern reminds you oddly of home. How, how so? Or, you know, something like that. I think that that will be able, for my group at least, uh, I, I think I'll be able to more directly engage them with questions like that, you know? Uh, for those DMs using their own worlds, that requires a lot of trust between them and the players. It's a very clear, agreed theme. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I Like, your theme is dark fantasy gothic, and they talk about cotton candy trees. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It requires a lot of a lot of agreement. I agree. The people I'm likely to GM for in the foreseeable, all avid critters, are going to love the player world building, I think. Even the quiet ones have no lack of imagination if given the space to talk. That's fucking awesome. Hell yeah. That's very, very cool. I'm I'm glad to hear it. That's it's very cool if you are if you feel comfortable asking these sorts of questions. That's very, very cool. Um Based on the answer. Describe the trees they are passing as having those features. This is utilizing one of the GM principles in Daggerheart. Ask questions and incorporate the answers. Then read the following aloud. As your steed pulls the carriage around a tight corner, one wheel coming off the ground for just a moment, you see an overturned merchant's cart lying sideways in the path before you, blocking your way. A scattering of fruits and vegetables litter the trail. From around the side of the carriage steps a Strix wolf, a large creature with the body of a wolf, the face of an owl, and large wings adorning its back. It finishes chewing its meal, the hand of the dead merchant, as it stares at you, curious, trying to judge whether you're friend or foe. Then you see, following clumsily behind, two small pups, watching their mother cautiously. 
From within, the rest of you feel your carriage come to a stop. What would you like to do? Very nice. Very, I, I, I like the, um, there's a, there's a core principle in Blades that I have been trying to incorporate into all of my games because I think it is such a good generalized principle is a uh, foreshadow danger foreshadow danger i think that this like stopping before the strix wolf attacks is like definitional foreshadow danger it is oh there is something very clearly dangerous right in front of you but you get a chance to act before the danger you know increases um and we'll see with the with the next session with an ambush. Foreshadowing danger can sometimes be tricky with an ambush, but I already have a thought on exactly how I want to do it. I already have a thought. <laughs> uh, allow the PCs to roleplay for a bit if they like. When somebody approaches the merchant cart, that will trigger the first action roll. Dun 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 dun. Action roll. Wow. Uh, definitely had a similar experience in the past with friends that only played 5e. Very confused with initial prompts to help world build, and some didn't really warm up to it at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, some people will be more into it than others. The the people that I am, you know, planning on playing uh, Daggerheart with, you know, the other content creators, are all DMs. So I think they will be very used to and open to the idea. But my at-home party? Uh, maybe not as much, you know? Um, so I think that there, but I still think that there are ways to incorporate that. Like I said, trying to work in their backgrounds a bit, um, like the, uh, uh, a lot of it is like backstory stuff. Uh, it's like, oh, the, uh, the merchant is wearing, uh, an outfit that reminds you of someone specific. What is the outfit and who does it remind you of? Or something like that. I think, which is actually a little bit more than Daggerheart is asking for, but I think relating it to something in their backstory where they can take the opportunity to reveal backstory stuff, I think will be more accessible for like 5e players. Um, I think the background is a way of doing it is very good. It's at least my first idea. I, I have not, you know, this is very new of me. I, I was not thinking about this uh, until I read over this quick start adventure. So I'm still kind of going through ways to work it in. Um, but th that's my initial thought so far. Uh, I'd be totally down with the players having a list or even a table, maybe literally rolling, but hey, if they really want to, <laughs> of descriptors, words, suggestions, if they're scared, they will blank. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. If they're scared, they'll blank. Giving them some some uh, discreet tools would be very nice. Yeah. Um, all right, the first action roll. The Strix, wor the Strix Wolf is wary of your movement. And... To be, to be uh, clear first, there is plenty of time for the PCs to do whatever they'd like. It is only when somebody approaches that it will trigger the action roll. So there's still this level of foreshadowing. We're not immediately having them make the action roll, right? The Strix Wolf is wary of your movement. Let's make our first roll to see how she reacts. This will be using your presence trait, so grab your duality dice and roll them. Then add your presence. You can also spend a hope before the roll to add an experience if it applies. Tell me the total and which die rolled higher. This is something I'm going to have to get used to, is that this system reminds me so much of, of Blades more than D&D, so it'll be weird for me to start asking for specific abilities again, because in Blades, um, PCs choose which ability they roll with. Um, so, like, the DM wouldn't say, like, roll with presence, uh... It, or roll for presence the pc would say i'm going to use presence so that's going to be a rewiring of my brain but absolutely not bad um so then they then they kind of lay out some successes and some critical successes uh if they rolled a 10 or higher it's a success uh describe the strix wolf calmly trying to keep her pups out of danger if the roll was with hope tell the player to mark a hope 
If the roll was with fear, take a fear token for later. You also have the opportunity to make a GM move. This is your chance to introduce a consequence to the scene. It should not undermine the success, but rather forward the narrative in, ex in an exciting way. You might say, the mother hoot howls as if calling to another Strix wolf among the trees. You know you might not be alone for long. I like that. I like that as a success uh, with with failure of like, I think I would, so we're, we're supposed to describe the calmly trying to keep her pups out of danger as well as this. So I would personally describe her like basically getting off the path in general so that, you know, she's not like if they go up to the cart, she won't really be a factor, but she is calling in and this is also an opportunity and I'm actually, I'll be honest, I'm kind of surprised that they didn't talk about it. Um, I think that it is probably because they don't want to overwhelm new GMs, but this seems like the absolute perfect time to introduce a counter or uh, whatever it's called in this uh countdown this seems like a very perfect place to introduce a countdown of you have this many seconds or this many whatever until another strix wolf shows up um you know you have this many counts on the countdown um i think very very good opportunity for that but i think it's probably like an overwhelming thing for for new gms uh, there are a couple of actual plays of this out. In one, the ranger shot the Strix Wolf the very instant it was described before the pups could be revealed. <laughs> Lol. <laughs> that pregen is described as shoots first, ask questions later. Fuck yeah, dude. That's just playing into the character. I'm telling you. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh, that's funny. Um, failure. They rolled a nine or below. It is a failure. Describe it, the, the Strix Wolf snarling and snapping, angry that the PC is approaching. And this is sort of um, this is sort of interesting about this action roll, about like what a failure is or isn't. This requires you to kind of assume what the what the failure is, like make it a bad thing, because. If the players just want to approach the Strix Wolf, you know, they, they if that is their thing, then even this success state might not be exactly what they want. Um, so sussing that out with their play with your players, which you'll, you know, you get better at as a campaign goes on about like what a character would want and what makes a success for that player. Um, you'll get you get better at that as you go on in a campaign. But this is kind of interesting to me of, like, the success is the Strix Wolf leaves. The failure is that they stick around, uh, which was, yeah, a little bit interesting. Um, I can't decide if I prefer Blades Clock mechanics or this style of countdown dice. I kind of find clocks more intuitive, but maybe that's me. I mean, I don't see – I don't want to say I don't see – I think there's sort of just aesthetic differences. Like, I think if you used Blades Countdown, like, like clocks, if you used Blades clocks, I think very little would actually change, you know? Uh, the dice are just... I think the dice are a really easy way to represent it on table. And that's something I realized a lot reading through this Quick Start Adventure is, again, a lot of it seems really purpose... Not, not purpose-built, but... A lot of it seems built with the kind of inward uh, assumption that you are playing on a physical table. So like a die, like a countdown die, is really easy to represent on a table in a way that a clock, like a blades clock, is actually, a, I don't want to say it's cumbersome, but it is not something that people have like really easy access to. Like you'll either have to buy clocks or you'll have to like, you know, draw them out or whatever. Whereas a countdown die, everyone's going to have that in their fucking polyhedral set. You just, you just count down. Um, uh, I shouldn't be afraid of clarifying. So what exactly are you trying to do? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it's it's kind of like how we talk with, uh, with Critical Role about how, like, Matt knows his players. They've been playing together for two years. He can, in most situations, assume 
what his players want and what those characters want because he is so familiar with them. But especially at the start, when you're not familiar, and honestly, when the players aren't really familiar yet, you, yeah, absolutely asking those clarifying sorts of questions of like, what like what sort of vibe are you going after right now like are you trying to are you trying to scare it off like is that the success state for you are you trying to like draw it in like that sort of thing the classic dm are you sure <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely um all right but the role was with hope tell the player to mark a hope you still get to make a gm move because it's with hope but because it's with hope, it shouldn't be as bad as it could be. You might say, with one last snarl, she leans down to have her pups clamber onto her back before taking off into the air, landing on a nearby branch. She is watching your every move. Huh. Interesting. To me... You know, this is fine. This is fine. I don't want to say it's not. But to me, this is a bit of Quantum Ogre. Which, um... Is there a bit missing there or in the wrong order? I don't think so. I I think I, I think it is sort of in the wrong order. So I think the role with hope is supposed to refer to this. And then if the role is with fear, things go badly. Describe the Strix Wolf snarling at the PC. Tell them to mark a stress. So I think basically this is the description of fear or of failure like this is what happens when you fail and then if the role is with hope they take a hope and if it's with fear they mark a stress and still do this um it's the way you're guessing in the pdf gotcha yeah so to me and again this isn't this isn't necessarily a bad thing uh, but if you don't know what i'm talking about i didn't know what i was talking about until very recently ryan immel taught me this uh concept of the quantum ogre where if you're i just talked about this yesterday i think but if you're a pc you know you're in front of two doors right two doors you want to think that there is something different behind each of these doors right that the rooms behind these are two different rooms that one of them contains an ogre and one of them contains, you know, fucking, like, treasure or whatever. And that choosing the right one will get you the right reward. The quantum ogre is the concept that the ogre is behind whichever door you choose. <laughs> no matter which door you choose, there's an ogre behind it. And this can sort of be confused and conflated sometimes with a concept that I talk a lot about, which is having floating uh, concepts. So later in Seeking an Arcanist, they talk about if the players would like to talk to an NPC, you can choose one of the options below. And then later it says, um, if they bypassed asking someone in the town, just use one of the NPCs from the list here instead. After a few exchanges, you can have the NPC say something like this. So these three NPCs are not in a specific location. These three NPCs are wherever you need them to be, right? They are wherever makes sense because you don't want to have to prep nine different NPCs, three that are wandering the streets, three that are in their homes, and three that are in the bar. You just want to be able to prep three and then wherever the PCs decide to go, that is where those NPCs happen to be. That is the that is the idea of the floating sort of plot point, the floating NPC. And there is a um there is there is sort of the I think the key difference between uh, uh, Schrodinger's ogre. Yeah, yeah. Sort of, uh, yeah, yeah, sort of Schrodinger's ogre. Yeah, the, the key difference between quantum ogre and what I would call a floating plot point or a floating NPC or a floating resource, a floating beat, is that the floating beat you have not portrayed as being different than something else. 
the key problem that Schro or not Schrodinger's or God Quantum Ogre hits on is when you present players with a choice that is not actually a choice. There's a it's a very key difference where the players if they are if there if it feels like there is a binary decision there needs to be two different outcomes otherwise it is it is the ogre god i just hit myself um however not over prepping and just using resources like if they it, the the key difference right is if they never ask to talk to an npc you will never encounter one of these NPCs. These NPCs are not going to be th forced down your throat. That's the key difference. Is it would the an example of this if we did it in the Quantum Ogre style is if you don't talk to one of these people on the streets right before you go into the tavern, one of them comes up to you. That is more Quantum Ogre-esque where you are forcing the PCs towards your plot line no matter what they choose whereas if you build <clears throat> sorry excuse me if you build just a couple of resources and then just use them whenever the pcs ask for them that is more of the floating concept in a module like this there is a lot of all roads ultimately lead to x and then y or at least z if you skipped y yeah but still room for variation yeah an adventure like this is inevitably going to be more what we would call on rails, and it might use more of the Quantum Ogre, but I think actually a, a good example of a way that this accomplishes not doing the Quantum Ogre, <laughs> but still having it be like you go to one place is the treehouse sequence. Give the players the option to role play and problem solve. Use the section below as guidance or create your own. Basically, they give a bunch of example options for how the people might get the treehouse down. The ultimate goal is just to get the treehouse down. It sort of doesn't matter how they do it. So this is sort of like if you have a an ogre situation, but you're actually looking for the ogre. And instead of doors that block what are behind them, it is like multiple obstacle courses. You know what I'm saying? So that is that is kind of how you um, avoid that issue within these modules is by giving very clear goals. And then the variation within the scene is how they approach those goals, how they problem solve within that. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> also, just having modular NPCs and locations and encounters ready at hand, but the entire plot itself might develop differently depending on player choices. Yeah, 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 exactly. The mental image of a floating ogre is very funny to me. Yeah. Multiple paths to one destination. Yeah, a lot of times I, I, I've been thinking about like how I conceptualize prepping more. More often, at least. Um, like... I consider it like this sort of where there is a certain climax that I am sort of funneling the uh, PCs to, but they have a lot of different choices on exactly how they get there. And those choices will have an impact on the story at large, right? And the key point is that they should be trying to get to here, right? Whether they know it or not. They, they, their goal is related to this climax that you are funneling them towards. And then there are certain ways that they can um, sort of escape from there. So the all roads lead to one destination is totally okay if the PCs are trying to get to that destination. The quantum ogre is when they're not trying to encounter the ogre. That's the main issue with quantum ogre is when they think that they're making a different choice, right? They don't think that they're going towards the ogre. They think that they're making a choice that like has consequences and has meaning. Whereas if they're trying to get to the ogre, absolutely that's that's fine, you know? 
Um, but they do have to encounter the key NPC somehow. What if the players were trying a few times and then give up and decide to go back to the tavern? Would you have the Arcanist come find them? So I would basically, I mean, uh, we'll, we'll read through uh, a lot of this and we'll see how the game recommends it. And then we'll see if I have any alternatives. Because I don't want to homebrew a whole landscape about things I don't know about. Um, <laughs> but I, w I might have them um, overhear a conversation related to the Arcanist. So it's a little bit of a, of a, of a trick. But I want to always keep the player agency in mind. I always want them to be choosing to engage. I think that's how you, av you avoid the core of the issue. Is by always having them choose to engage. So I think there is a key, a key difference between having an NPC come up to them and having them overhear an NPC conversation or observe an NPC doing something that may be relevant. Because then they still have to actively choose to go after and engage with that NPC. Daggerheart might have a more direct like a more direct thing, but that is kind of my my uh, my distinction between the two. Is I don't want to force the NPC down their throat, um, but I do want to narratively drive them towards like, hey, that might be where the clue is. But if you want to just like if if they say like for example, we don't want to talk to the NPCs, we're not really socially adept. Is there any indication of where the Arcanist might live? That's maybe like more of a survival check, right? Now we're getting into maybe like instinct roles on like, okay, like maybe you could find a sign pointing there. Maybe you could see something on the horizon. Someone might say, I want to climb a tree to get a better view of the forest and, I mean, this is a little bit of spoilers, but the Arcanist treehouse fucking glows. <laughs> it glows with, like, a fucking ethereal light. Um, so, if someone went that direction, if they got a very high vantage point and were just trying to look for signs of the Arcanist, they might absolutely be able to skip that whole NPC interaction if they wanted to. So, I think a lot of this is also... As a, I think, I think part of, and I think part of what Matt would definitely, or not Matt, I should say, part of what Daggerheart would recommend in this vein, right, is like this beat by beat is good to have, but let me, let me pull up something from the playtest. Let me pull up something from the playtest. Uh, Brandley Mul Mulligan's metaphor for this is water trickling down a mountain, many paths, one direction, all the tension between the player wanting a satisfying the plot and the character just doing stuff. Yeah, I think I've seen that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree. Um, encourage them to want the goal, but don't force them. Yeah, absolutely. That's where I tend to bring character hooks, which is absolutely key. I totally agree. Because you don't, you don't want to force the plot on them, but... They, you want them to want it. Yeah. Uh, four GMs new to Daggerheart. I'm, I'm, uh, the story always moves forward. F is it in Follow the Narrative? There is something where they talk about, I was, I was reading over this more last night in bed. Do, 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 do. Hey, Bubba, you're okay. Oh, she's singing the song of her people. Uh, let's see. I believe it was after... No, was it after Adversaries? Son of a bitch. Core Guidance. GM Principles. Hold on. Gently. Best Practices. Preparing a session. Ah, Thinking in Beats. Okay. I think this is... This is this will be good. I think I, I was... I was reading this... And at first, I really spurned against this advice. Not spurned against it. I really was like, bah, I don't want it. Um, but I think this is really... I actually think this is good advice. Especially for kind of what we're talking about. Is when you're prepping the story, think about it in beats. Of 
this thing, this number eight happens, then this number seven, then this number six. The PCs can jump in at any of these points, but these are the points that will progress. These are the parts of your story, right? So I'll just read through this whole example. If you are preparing a session where a mercenary company seizes control of a border town in a narrow mountain pass to prepare a kingdom for invasion and thinking in beats for a countdown, you might do it like this. The mercenary company makes a partnership with the neighboring kingdom. One of the mercenaries arrives in town and gets a job with the city guard. The undercover mercenary gets assigned to night duty. Bye. As expected for new hires, the undercover mercenary ambushes the other night guards and unlocks the town gate. The mercenaries rush through the open gate and attack the guards' barracks and the mayor's house. The mercenaries kill or subdue the city guard and capture the mayor under threat of violence to the townspeople. The mayor pledges loyalty to the invading warlord. The warlord's forces arrive to resupply as the mercenaries hold the town to protect the invaders' supply lines, and then the invasion begins. So, to, to take this all back to this, to the Sablewood Messengers... The general thing of this is the merchant cart, the thicket thieves, the seeking an arcanist, the tree house, and then the ward renewal. We know as DMs, if we are in part one, if we're in part one, part two, part three, part four, uh, and then part five, if we are in part one and our players do something totally unexpected, all we have to do is get to part two. I think that's the thing that we that we have to remember is the part two is the thicket thieves, right? So no matter what they do to the Strixwolf, no matter where how many directions they go from the Strixwolf, the improv part of it is just getting them all the way back to the ambush, which for an ambush is actually not that hard. You just have the ambush happen. <laughs> so there's actually a pretty clear path back to two on this. After the ambush, let's say that in the ambush, the their cart is destroyed or they get turned around or they get lost. All we need to do is for number three, the Seeking and Arcanist, we just have to get them to hush. So no matter what they do on two, no matter how direct or weird their path is, we improv a way to get them back to Hush. And then once they're in Hush, all they have to do is get to the treehouse. So, within this context, within the context of what we're talking about with these NPCs, the shortest path between three and four is the NPCs. Right? The NPCs just telling them this is how you get from Hush to the treehouse. That's the shortest path. But say they don't want to talk to the NPC. Say they say we want to find the Arcanist by uh, fucking just trying to find it, right? That's this path down here. And you say, okay. As a DM, you say, okay, okay, okay. You're, you're looking for it. Let me think about it. So when you are prepping, one of the things I liked about the thinking in beats recommendation is when you're prepping your campaigns or your sessions even you don't have to think about all of these in-between states all of these in-between states don't think about them your players are going to surprise you you are never going to be able to predict all of that wibbly wobbly shit all you have to do is think hard about your beats because if I know the treehouse really well and my players are in number three and they really don't want to talk to an NPC, they really want to go off this direction. If I know number four really well, I can direct them back to it. If they say I want to climb a tree, I know the treehouse is luminescent. They will be able to see the treehouse from very far away. So... I can hook them back towards the treehouse. So that is that is where I would where I would go with this is like that's the improv is you know these you know points well and you just hook your players back whenever they get off the path. 
you hook your players back towards them. And there is a like there's a large amount of skill there that you just learn over the years, but yeah. Uh, this is also interesting and so complex and so intimidating to have to do on the fly. <laughs> it's all practice. It's all practice. Uh, it is getting feedback, adjusting. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And figuring out what works for you, how you like to visualize it. Like for me, the hourglass method, or what I call the hourglass method, of having like, I always think about it in rules of three, where I do try to, like I just said, don't try to predict your players. For me... Trying to predict them in very um, generalized terms helps me a lot. Um, but I do it, again, in kind of pairs of threes. So I'm like, okay, these are like three ways that they might get into this situation, which will lead them ultimately towards number one. You know, these are three ways. And then these are three ways that they might exit number one, which lead into these like three even more vibey things. And then all of these now become the next layer for going into number two, right? So this is how I picture a lot of my prep. So going on the uh, on like the plot beat discussion of like you'll ne you know I was saying you'll never be able to predict all of this. I try to predict it in very generalized categories. So, like, to me, this is the merchant cart, right? Number one is, is the merchant cart. So, my, like, three intros. Now, with this, you're very directly confronted with it. So, you basically don't have to worry about all of this intro. This would be more important if you were, like, in an actual campaign. So, you don't really need to worry about all that. But for the three ways that they might exit, they might uh, kill... The Strix Wolf, they might uh, scare it off, or they might befriend it. They might they might befriend it, right? These are very generalized path. They absolutely might do something that is not any of these three. And in fact, we could even get even more generalized with this. Is is just like. <laughs> They, the Strix Wolf stays, the Strix Wolf leaves, or they ignore the Strix Wolf. Like, we can get very generalized with this, and then if they ignore the Strix Wolf, you know, what's going to happen? The Strix Wolf maybe attacks them, the Strix Wolf maybe leaves. Like, we can start thinking about very generalized concepts there, but... In terms of this session, I'm probably not going to be thinking about a lot of that too much. Uh, because they have so many recommendations for us. But those are some of the things I think about sometimes. Um, all right. Mm -mm. You'll be great. I agree. You'll be great, AKL. You just got to start doing it. All of this stuff that I'm describing is what works for me. It absolutely might not work for everyone. Uh, the skill part is how subtly and or how entertaining you do this redirecting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but would think back later, what could I have said instead? Yeah. Which is why I like to record my sessions now. Like, I, when I have a session, I'm like, man, I really could have introduced something there that would have been different or that would have been cooler. Or I have a situation where I'm like, oh, man, that was so sick. <laughs> I need to do that again. Um, so, yeah, ab absolutely. I agree. Familiar from writing to a large degree. Plans are useless. Planning is essential. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with, th I agree with that quote a lot. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, we have our Strix Wolf. Um, so. It looks like, so when I brought up the Quantum Ogre originally, it seems like in both of these cases, uh, the Strix Wolf kind of leaves. <laughs> like, she she either leaves to keep her pup out of danger, or she leaves because you failed. So, this to me is a bit Quantum Ogre of like, well, she leaves either way. It's just like, how badly it goes for you. Which I don't love. I don't love. And one of the things I'm thinking about 
is if we're starting from number one, if we're starting from number one, I know because I've read through this a little bit that we are about to go into an ambush after this, right? So my my thinking is that on a success, on the success state versus the failure state, on the success, the Strix Wolves just kind of fuck off. They just kind of fuck off and we keep going. On the failure state, they seem like they fuck off, but when we route back to number two, which is the ambush, uh-oh, because you failed, kerchonk, the, the Strix Wolves come into the ambush. So the failure to defuse the situation in beat one is going to make beat two that little bit harder. That is kind of what I'm thinking so far. Because otherwise, it seems like there's not... Like, especially if you fucking fail with hope. If you fail with hope, what's the difference between that and... Honestly, failing with hope in this case seems better than succeeding with fear. Because with succeeding with fear, another Strix wolf shows up. <laughs> So honestly, this this seems worse within their recommended uh, uh, you know state. So these are the general aspects that I'm thinking of. Although, let's think about this a little bit more because there are four aspects to this, right? There are four aspects. On number one, there is kind of like this. So there's failing uh with fear which i think i i like what they did we can abstract these both just into the fail state and just if you fail with fear you also get a stress and what we could do is we could abstract these both into the success state and where and where like the gm just gets the fear if we want but they also do want us to complicate the situation a little bit so I'm thinking if it's a success, the the Strix Wolf totally fucks off. If it's a fear, they maybe stick around. So success with fear, they stick around and they may or may not impact beat two negatively. So I'm thinking on a success with fear, they stick around and they're maybe there for, for beat two. Maybe. This path is automatic they're fucking they're angry they're they're upset but this one i don't know they're not so sure they're a little bit questioning they may join you they may join the thicket thieves they're just going to be there presenting a potential threat so if this is a success with failure during the number two, during the ambush with the Thicket Thieves, I am absolutely going to remind the players that the Strix Wolves are there. I will absolutely be reminding them of that factor and being like, "You, they're eyeing this entire combat. They aren't getting involved yet, but you're not sure. And honestly, if the Strix Wolves do absolutely nothing else, that mental impact on the players is totally worth a failure. <laughs> that is psychological warfare to just have these two predators watching your fight as it goes, <laughs> knowing that they could leave, they could join, they could join for you, they could join for the others. Having this just neutral third party is what I am thinking of for the success with failure. I need to actually fucking write this down though. Um, okay, I need to I need to open up a note. Wait one second, because <laughs> I do like that. Uh, let me open up my today note. Da 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 da. Okay, prep for. Oh wait. Uh. And I'm not going to show this on screen just because it has a lot of personal stuff on it. Because this is like my personal obsidian that I'm writing in. Uh, prep for dagger heart. 
Uh, for part one, I'm thinking on success with fear. Strix wolves stay around. Stay around. <laughs> Psychological warfare. Uh, on pure. Or wait, I need to. I need to note this more. On pure success. Uh, should I? Should I? Uh, can I? Can I hide the personal stuff? Because I kind of want you guys to see this. Yeah, I can hide the personal stuff. Okay. Uh, let's do application captures. Obsidian. Do, 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 do. There it is. Okay. So for beat one, I'm thinking success. Uh, I should say success with hope. Success with hope is Strix Wolf uh, fucks off. <laughs> uh, failure with hope. Failure with hope is that they get into long range, but stick around and will probably join the um, enemies next, uh, enemies in beat two, but <laughs> party gains a hope. But party gains a hope, um, and I'm going to say maybe like DC to scare them off will put at like a 10 for failure with hope. But for failure with fear, all the same shit, but the party does not get a hope, and I'm going to see the DC to scare them off is a 15. So we have sort of this escalating thing where a very similar thing happens, but the DC to scare them off is worse because they failed with fear rather than failing with hope. That's sort of what I'm feeling for this. And you can see there's really, like, in terms of, like, what I'm actually prepping for, it's pretty fucking generalized. I'm not even, like, thinking that much about it. We're just, we're just getting, we're just going quick, you know? Maybe success with fear gives a new opportunity. They stick around, but roll to see if you can persuade the wolf to join you. And if they, if you fail, they turn against you. Yeah, yeah, that's totally fair. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. DC to uh, join. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. DC to persuade the Strix Wolf. Wolf, and we'll set it at a 10. We'll set it at a 10. On failure, they fight against. On success, they join. If the players don't try they just observe they just they just chill it they just chill there you know um just subtly increasing the cognitive strain absolutely pulling the strix wolf into the ambush under some conditions yeah that's what i'm thinking that's what i'm thinking also makes sense for predators who have clearly uh habituated to feeding on humanoids to be aware that combat might mean dinner later that's exactly what i'm thinking is that on the success with fear they're just like, hmm, I don't know. Like, let's see. They they just observe. And regardless, they stay around psychological warfare. Also call another Strix Wolf. So we're putting the party into a more precarious situation, right? There are two Strix Wolves observing this. If the party doesn't interact, they just chill out. But if the party does interact, it's a relatively easy check where they might be able to get the Strix Wolves on their side, but it's a risk because on a failure, they will fight against you. Yeah, I like that. Uh, don't they already have to do some kind of check to soothe them before? If they fail that in the last case, aren't they automatically under DC-15? Um, oh, wait, that's a different thing. Let's see. So I think what you're talking about, CR Obsidian, doo -doo 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 -doo, 
in this uh, in this case, there's no there's no real soothe check. It is just when they walk up to the Strix Wolf. If they roll a success, the Strix Wolf tries to keep her pups out of danger. If it's a success with fear, which is the which is the ten, um, then there is some sort of consequence. So in this recommendation, again, if they rolled a ten or higher. The mother calls in another Strix Wolf. So that's sort of what we're modeling with this part of it, of the success with failure. They stick around, they call in another Strix Wolf, and then there is another opportunity to interact with them. So we're still rewarding the success. We want to always make sure that we're rewarding the success. The success with failure is that the situation gets a little dicey. Or, the sorry, the, the success with fear is that the situation gets a little dicey, right? So the success with hope is exactly what you're saying. The Strix Wolf just fucked off. But the success with fear is, yeah, if they don't interact with it, they, they're fine. The Strix Wolf does not attack them at all. But there is a little bit of stress, a little bit of tension point. And honestly, I might even allow this uh, later on in the um, later on in a uh, in a later in a later combat um, in, in the very last in beat five. Uh, there is a way that the DM can spend fear to generate more enemies. I might even allow for beat two, let's see, for beat two, which is the Thistlewood ambushers, right? For beat two, I could build in a, uh, like, GM can spend three fear for the Thistlewood uh, ambushers to convince the Strix Wolves to join in. So we could even have a, a fear ability where now the DM has to spend a resource. That was the benefit of, you know, doing the uh, doing the success. The DM has to spend a resource to get these Strix Wolves involved. But they do, they do have that option. And then for uh, failure and hope, they get into a long range, which again is what the this recommends. If they roll a nine or below... Um, they, the Strix Wolf is snarling and snapping, angry that the PC is approaching. Um, that's just like a pure failure. And then if the roll was with hope, you might say that they leave, right? So the failure with hope is they get into long range, they chill out, they, they leave, but they're still upset at you. And I'm thinking when they see other people come in, they're going to join those other people. Because it doesn't say like what they ever do. Right during the thicket thieves scenario, it does not reference the Strix wolves again. <laughs> so that's you know, there is no it, if we don't think about what the Strix wolves are doing, if we don't think about what this failure means, it doesn't actually mean a whole lot, <laughs> unless you fail with fear. If you fail with fear, they mark a stress. Um, and but if they fail with hope. The fucking the 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 PC gets hope and the Strix Wolf just leaves. So we need to think about what this failure actually means for future stuff. Which is what I'm which is what I'm thinking here. And they can fly to stay out of danger, so likely behave more like ravens than wolves who would fuck off much further. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. If they see all of you flightless scrubs, they're just gonna go up to the trees and wait to see how this shit goes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I'm liking these. I'm liking these generalized paths, and then we can just see what the what the uh, PCs do. We can just see what they do, and then oh, I forgot critical success. If both die, roll the same number. It's a crit success. Tell the PC to mark hope, clear stress if they have one. Then describe the Strix Wolf moving towards the PC, head down, tail wagging. It sniffs their head and sits in front of them. <laughs> Okay. Ooh. Okay. Whoa, wait, wait. I've got something here. Okay. 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 So, 
we have another and even better critical success. Critical success. Uh, befriend, befriend Strix Wolf. Yay! Now something that we can do here, the Strix Wolf. You might remember. Wait, what? This is the Strix Wolf mother. Does she not have? Oh, interesting. She doesn't have it. Okay, wait, wait, wait. We just saw the Strix Wolf, right? The Strix Wolf earlier. The Strix Wolf has powerful senses. This creature ignores the hidden condition on anyone within close range. The next part of this, the Thicket Thieves, is that there are these thistle folk that are supposed to be sneaking up on the PCs. Right? That's like part of the ambush. Uh, and one of the options is see them coming, where they are supposed to make an instinct roll with a difficulty of 14. I'm thinking because this is, right, the, the thistle folk are attempting to stay hidden. That's like part of their whole shtick right now. Oh, wait, you guys can't see the, you guys can't see the thing. Let me... Let me, I need to, I need to shrink obsidian a little bit. La, 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 la. Oh man, you really can't see that though. Wait, what if I, wait, 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 wait. We know exactly how to do this and people are getting ahead of me, but that's fine. I'm down with that. Uh, quick size, quick, quick font size adjustment. How's that? Oh, that's still a little, a little, a little small. Uh, wait. If I do that, oh man, I'm thinking that. But if I could cut off this side bit, wait. Let's see. I can. I can. I know. I know how to. I know how to get this done. There we go. And then we can put it like right there. How's that? How's that uh, in terms of like readability? Can you guys read that? And then I can slightly scooch over Opera so that we're more like this. How's this in terms of readability? Um, are you showing us what you want to be showing us? AKL, you are, yeah, yeah, you are absolutely correct. I was not showing you what I wanted to show you. Looks good? Sick. Okay. Um, instant Strix Wolf pet on success. Insta Strix Wolf pet. Um, yeah, so I'm absolutely thinking with the Strix Wolf's powerful senses, with it ignoring the hidden condition, you know, maybe it's a, yeah, it's a little bit of a pet. It's just kind of prowling around as they're investigating, and then it will lower the instinct roll DC. It lowers the instinct roll DC from a 14 to a 10, as it perks up its ears and looks towards the bushes. There's still a chance that, you know, the PCs don't see what it sees, but I think it lowers this instinct roll because of the crit success. Befriend St Strix Wolf um, will hang out around the party uh, when the ambush is about to start. Uh, it notices something in the brush, lowering the instinct roll for detecting the ambush from 14 to 10. I like that. I like that a lot. Okay, so then that is beat one done. Beat one done. Now, let's see what we have here. The Ambush, Thicket Thieves, The Fallout. Let the events of the previous act play out, allowing the players to roleplay and take other actions. Use the scenarios below for guidance. Scenarios. If they search the merchant cart, you could talk about the cart being stripped of all valuables and showcase the dead driver with a mangled arm picked over by the Strix Wolf family for food. If the PCs inspect the body further, they might find out that the driver had his neck slit. Honestly, so this is where earlier I was talking about, like, you always foreshadow danger. Um, I'm thinking that for mine, I'm going to modify this slightly. And 
I think I am not going to put it behind like a second layer of inspection. It is just if they search the merchant cart, they will notice that the driver had his neck slit. Be and and the, you know if they are like, does it look like a fucking uh, <laughs> a fucking Strix Wolf did that? I am going to be like, no, very clearly it does not. Um, <laughs> because that will foreshadow the type of danger that the party might be in in uh, in the future. Uh, making the throat slitting more obvious. Or you could build in... So there's either... There's, there's a couple of ways to go about it. You can either make there be more sources of foreshadowing. So you can have them be harder to get to, like putting the uh, neck slit behind two separate things. And you could also... Um, you could also highlight... One of the things that you could highlight that does foreshadow the danger is talking about the cart being stripped of all valuables you could highlight that it is like the chests are open and like very clearly have been looted like these are like strong boxes full of gold right make it very clear that things are gone from the cart that the strix wolves would not have taken um i think either of those very much foreshadows the danger and in that case you can have the next slit hid behind it so like the highlighting the stripped of all valuables really prominently and then if they search further then having the next slit be more um obvious or having this be downplayed slightly but also having this be more obvious you can kind of pull these levers a little bit if you want um, if they attack the Strix Wolf, have them make a melee attack, uh, at a difficulty of 10 on a success. They deal damage dealing, using their weapon. The pups will flee. The Strix Wolf mother has three HP and some like decent damage thresholds. Um, interesting. If they fail any rolls to interact with the Strix Wolf, it will put its pup on its back and fly to a nearby tree, watching the adventurers from above. If they try to find signs of something strange, they see the remnants of thorny bramble tangled around the wheel of the carriage and strewn across the road. Aha, that's another one. I like, okay, you know what? Maybe I spoke too soon about, how, about modifying this. I think if you litter it with strange signs, right? Like searching the merchant cart, being stripped of valuables, looking even further into the next slit, thorny bramble tangled around the wheels, like... All of these, I, I would want to make sure that I hit at least one thing. So, like, if they want to move the merchant cart out of the way, are taking steps to get the carriage moving again, or trying to leave the trail, move to the ambush. I would want to have at least a really minor bit of foreshadowing that is totally, like, almost guaranteed. Um... It's not absolutely necessary, but all of these, uh, they only get if they ask the right questions. I would want something that is very ambiguous um, that they get no matter what. So, I actually think something that I like here is the remnants of Thorny Bramble tangled around the wheel of the carriage. I like that because that is absolutely something that they could misinterpret as being natural. But it is also something that sort of sort of might indicate that something weird is going on. Uh, guaranteed info. I like I like that as guaranteed info. Unless the PCs go out of their way to be oblivious, probably because they're trying to tame the Strix Wolves, they will stumble upon some kind of big hint. Yeah. Unless they are honestly, but even if they're being oblivious. I want them to get something that could be interpreted suspiciously. I want them to pick something very, very small. This could absolutely be interpreted as, oh, they ran over some bramble. Like, this could be interpreted super benignly. And honestly, something that you could even do is you could place this information back in beat one. 
So you could put this back in beat one so that they have some time to actually forget about the foreshadowing. Um, so you put it back in, in beat one when you are still describing the nature of the carriage. That way they maybe have in the back of their minds that something weird is going on. But then they have the whole interaction with the Strix Wolf. And they might forget. And then after that interaction with the Strix Wolf, they they uh, might search it out more at that point. Uh, I kind of feel like the overturned cart itself is foreshadowing the ambush on a road deep in the forest in hindsight because of tropes, but I see your point. To some degree. But I think that could also be very mi very easily misinterpreted when you show an overturned cart and then you immediately show a potential enemy that is munching on the driver. <laughs> I think there is a very clear... Um, I mean, the Strix Wolf is a red herring. Like, it's supposed to be a red herring. Um, but I think that describing something that... Like, the, the Strix Wolf would not have tangled up the thorny bramble around the wheel. So giving them that and then giving them the Strix Wolf and then moving into all of those optional points. Yeah. I think that's how I'll do it. I think that's how I'll do it. Um, but we're very much into, like, this is me prepping for how I will run Daggerheart within my style. There is, there is very much a layer here of if you want things to be more ambiguous and that, like, fits your style, absolutely great. Like, if you want to, I don't want to say train your players, but <laughs> if you want to instill within your players that if they don't look, they don't ask the right questions, that they won't get the right info, I think that's totally fair. I think that is absolutely a fair way to go about this sort of thing. Like, ambushes are honestly the rare time where, like, I still like to foreshadow danger. I think that that is, like, slowly becoming one of my core DMing principles. But I think that ambushes are maybe distinctly one of the only places where maybe you don't have to foreshadow it as much because of the very nature of what it is. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, so this does come down to how generous you want to be, what you want your PC D GM interactions to be like, that sort of thing. Okay. The ambush. When the moment feels right or one of the above scenarios triggers it, ask the PC who seems like they are paying attention to their surroundings to make an instinct roll, which I will say... If none of my PCs are paying attention, even with the critical success of the Strix Wolf, I, honestly, that might be a thing. I might actually build that into the critical success of uh, it will, when the ambush is about to start, it notices something in the brush, lowering the instinct rule for detecting the ambush to from 14 to 10 or allowing them to roll instinct or to roll the original instinct roll even if none of them were originally paying attention because that's a big thing if none of them are paying attention and they are all like distinctly narrated to be oblivious yeah i might not even give them the option to roll the instinct roll so that's part of maybe my personal style is i want to give them guaranteed clues towards making the right decisions. And then if they still choose not to, I'm pretty punishing. <laughs> so that is that is maybe my st more inside of my style is I want to give them a, uh, a guaranteed clue that maybe sets them on edge, maybe sets them towards paying attention to their surroundings, sets one of them to be the guard, let's say. And if they actively choose not to do that, that's on them they don't even get an instinct roll. <laughs> that's that's sort of wh where my mind goes with it. But you could be, you know, generally the opposite. And that also comes down to me being, I've talked about this all the time during Critical Roll, I am a low roll DM. I roll a lot less at my tables. Um, 
So, that, that sort of thing fits into that low roll style. If you're a higher rolling DM, you might not need to waste time giving the guaranteed foreshadowing if you're going to give them an instinct roll regardless. So these are things to consider, things to weigh. On a success. I'm, I'm not particularly worried about copying your style because one, I plan to copy a bunch of D different GMs. Absolutely. Uh, best GM steal. Uh, and two, I'm pretty confident I will figure out my own style. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely will. Uh, but I do appreciate you pointing out things that are characteristic about what you like to do. Yeah, I want to, I want to draw attention to, like, this thing that I do is not explicitly correct. It is just, I think it is correct within my overall ethos, and I think a lot of the things that I do work together. So if you don't like this other thing that I do, you probably won't want to do this thing as well. <laughs> because they are very explicitly, like, meant to work together. Um, ah! Oh, I just, I, I was reaching for the pistachios and I made a mistake. Um, okay. On a success, they notice eyes watching them from the darkness beyond the trail. If it was with fear, the PC marks the stress. Use the see them coming prompts. On a uh, failure, if they, they are immediately ambushed. If it was with fear, the PC marks a stress. Use the ambush prompts. I don't see anything that needs to be changed about that. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Not to say that anything needs to be changed. Anything I want to change. So, for see them coming. You hear the sound of a branch snapping and turn to see four thistle folk sneaking through the underbrush, attempting to get the jump on your party. The overturned cart was a distraction, but their plan didn't work. I'm taking out the action tracker, and we're going to set up a map. Ambushed. In a whirlwind of cracking branches and unsheathed blades, a group of four thistle folk jump out from the brush alongside the road. The overturned cart was an ambush. They stand before you, weapons drawn, blocking the road. I'm taking out the action tracker, and we're going to set up a battle map. They'll act first. Setting up a battle map. So, this is something that I was really curious about. And this is one of the parts where I'm like, oh, this seems a little bit more in-person oriented. Set the action tracker somewhere within reach of all players. Remind them that any time they make an action roll, they must first add a token. You then take the forest terrain you've cut out and ask your players to help you spread it across the table to build a map. Uh, you may also encourage them to grab other items from around the room and add terrain to the map. Build out the play space together. Finally, place the overturned merchant's cart on the table and ask the players to put their miniatures nearby where they think they would be in the scene, along with their carriage. Take out the Thistlefolk Ambusher Standees and the Thistlefolk Thief. Uh, what up, Bracca? How you doing? How you doing? Uh, beginning the encounter. Below, you'll find the stat blocks for the Ambushers and the Thieves. You'll use those stat blocks to run the remainder of this encounter. So I've, I've looked through this encounter. Seems like a pretty like straightforward um example of combat i will say i like the thistle folks goal the ambushers are meant to keep the party's attention while the thief attempts to steal their carriage and that is absolutely how i will be running this encounter because especially the thief if i go back to the thistle folk thief they have a move called back off Spend a fear and make an attack roll against the target. On a success, the thief places their hand on the target's chest and blasts them backwards, dealing 2d8 magic damage and pushing them into far range. They fucking just blast you out of the sky. <laughs> so, you use the ambushers to get the thief to the carriage, and if there's anywhere one around the carriage, the thief just fucking blows them away. <laughs> So I will absolutely be uh, running this encounter with that in mind. I think that is very, very important. Because otherwise, the encounter doesn't really seem purpose-built to like really fuck with the players all that much. You know what I'm saying? Not to say that I want to fuck with the players. But like that seems to be the purpose of the encounter, is this potential stolen carriage business. So, what I'm thinking, right? So, 
we've got our kind of paths coming out of one. And all of these paths are leading back to two. Now, we're having the combat. There's a couple of options. And I want to see if they... If they um... Okay, yeah, they don't even... Uh... They don't even talk about, like, the actual, like, potential fallout of the ambush of the combat. So we have to determine that ourselves. So, the fallout of the combat will either be... I think there's kind of, like, three options, right? The Thistle Folk die. Uh, the Thistle Folk fucking dead. Skull and crossbones, motherfucker. The Thistle Folk run, or the Thistle Folk succeed. I guess there is also the possibility of the party running, but this is where I talk about, you know, sometimes the party can surprise you, sometimes they won't. I really do not anticipate any party I run, I run with uh, running away from this combat. I, it certainly is a possibility, but... I am willing to bet that I will just be able to improv it because I think it is pretty unlikely. So I'm not really going to prep for it. Um, the horse or horses have been essentially abstracted away for simplicity's sake, I guess. Or is this a magical carriage? You know, they don't specify. But I will say later during the ward renewal... They definitely imply that it's super magic. <laughs> uh, there is one mention of your steeds in passing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they do not. They, they have at least abstracted it uh, a, a decent amount. So, these are kind of our three things. If the Thistle Folk run, I also don't think that I will really need to think about this that much. Like, if the Thistle Folk run away, I don't really anticipate my PCs chasing after them. Especially if we have talked about the Sablewood, we have talked about all of the dangerous things that could be lurking in the underbrush. I don't anticipate my party really chasing after them. So I think we can erase this expectation as well so i think there are kind of two i would say real paths that we might have to consider is that the thistle folks succeed and i'm counting succeeding as fully getting away at which case the party just don't have the carriage anymore they kind of fucking fail because the carriage contains the thing that they need to get to uh, the Arcanist. So this is bad. This is really, really bad for our story if the Thistle folks succeed <laughs> in their goal. But we have to consider it because the Thistle folk are trying to succeed and the dice might be fully against our players that day. So we have to think about their motivation is to steal the carriage, which contains the MacGuffin <laughs> inside of it. But if they do that, then our entire rest of our story is fucking screwed. <laughs> hmm, so what do we do? <laughs> uh, it might as well be a self-propelled carriage, also more tempting to steal. True. Uh, maybe the Thistle Folk dump the big heavy things as they're rushing away. Possible. So that is, that is a possibility. So we can think about this, right? That is one line that we could think about. What up, Irish Thomas? How you doing? That is, uh, that is one line that we can consider is they dump the things. And this can kind of be our contingency line. This can kind of be our contingency for if all else fails is they dump the big heavy shit, maybe to make the carriage faster. And like, Especially, if we abstract this into being a self-propelled carriage, they might literally just want the carriage. And so if the PCs are catching up to them at all, which they have to because this has the MacGuffin, then the Thistle Folk dump the big heavy shit, make the cart faster to the point where the PCs can't catch up. But now they have to haul the big heavy thing all the way to Hush. This 
sounds like a good consequence. And honestly, if you want to end your prep there, like if you just want to prep that line and have that line fully lead to three with some amount of consequence, like, right, we have to, we have to determine a consequence for this line, which I'm thinking right now, I'm honestly, oh, I need to erase all that. Right now, I'm honestly thinking that that seems like a very good place to give a very distinct stress uh, consequence. So, I'm going to say stress, bro, I might even say plus two for everyone. Or actually, no, 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 no. You know what I would love? You know what I would love that would be so evocative, right? So, I'm prepping this for three people. So, I was about to say two stress for the entire party. Per very big debuff, but they fucking lost. They deserve a really big debuff. They deserve a really big consequence, right? So they absolutely deserve this. They lost. That's their punishment. I was originally thinking two stress per, but what might actually be more interesting is six stress split however they want. However they want which i think number one is interesting but i also think could be sort of evocative of like one person doing most of the work <laughs> to to get the thing there and you know what i'll even be a little nice to them i'll lower the stress amount i'll lower the stress amount to where it's still more than it would have been but i'll call it four so four stress split however they want so that if they just have their fucking guardian just loading it onto their shoulders and tromping the entire way there. <laughs> and their guardian has four stress once they get to hush. I think that's hilarious. <laughs> I think that's so fucking funny. So I think that that is, that is what I'm thinking. Or they can split it up a little bit more evenly uh, if they're, you know, actually carrying it together. I like, I like this line. I like this line. So if the Thistle Folk uh, succeed, they will eventually dump the MacGuffin, but the party now has to haul the MacGuffin all the way to Hush. They take a bunch of stress in the process. Um... Takes one level of exhaustion. It precisely, precisely, yeah. They go on a side quest to get the MacGuffin back. You know, honestly, if we were running an actual campaign, if this was not a one-shot style deal, I would absolutely have the Thistle Folk take the MacGuffin. Absolutely. Um, because then we can, like, go and there's a whole exploration challenge to, like, find where the Thistle Folk went. There's a whole, like, backstory of lore about how the Thistle Folk live in the deepest, like, realm of the Bramble that nowhere, no one else will go to. And that most of the people in their villages are pretty chill. <laughs> so, if this was a normal... Like, if this was just a set piece within my campaign, and honestly, if I was, even if I was starting my campaign with this, but I was planning on going on with it, and I wasn't planning on this being, like, a distinct one-shot, I would absolutely have the Thistle Folk just off with the MacGuffin. <laughs> I would absolutely do that. Because this is a one-shot, we need something to get us a little bit back on track. We need to get to beat three. It's just what has to happen because we're in a one-shot. But we can still give them a punishment for it. We want to give them a punishment. We don't want to feel like, oh, you lost the combat. Congratulations. You know, it's you just get it back. Um, <laughs> I'm already worried about this adventure fitting into three hours as it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> precisely. Precisely. Uh, the Thistle Folk sound fairly interesting. That would be a fun detour if there was uh, no time scope constraints. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways. So we have this. We have this detour. And we could consider this just a resource suck uh, combat. And we could just say that if the Thistle Folk, if the Thistle Folk die or they run or, or whatever, that we just go to, we just go to three. Like, I don't see really any, like, 
reward that we need to give them. Because the Thistle Folk just have a serrated blade. Which, to be fair, if maybe the PCs want the serrated blade, maybe they could take it. Uh, you know, maybe maybe the uh, Thistle Folk have, like, one... Oh, no. Ah, it's getting confused. Maybe they have, like, one handful of gold. Maybe they have, like, one handful of gold on them uh, uh, between all of them. I don't think that they have like the original riches from the from the um garage on them. We could also do something to the degree of uh ooh. I have an idea. I have an idea. I have an idea. So we'll give them one handful of gold. But there is something later in this. There's the ward renewal. This is basically the final combat. During the ward renewal, do 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 do. The ritual begins. Um, Allura, or sorry, <laughs> the White Fire Arcanist, uh, not Allura, um, <laughs> goes through her whole uh, her whole deal, and there are four ancient skeletons and two forest rays that you fight by default. However. You feel rumble as four ancient skeletons emerge from the ground, rusty stones in hand, disturbed by the forces of magic used by the Arcanist. And there is a Vengeance of the Veil, which is an encounter move, where you spend a fear to call forth two additional skeletons from the ground within close range of the carriage. Do you know what I'm seeing? I'm seeing a foreshadowing opportunity, baby. <laughs> I am seeing if we defeat the Thicket Thieves, or the, the yeah, the Thicket Thieves, we get one handful of gold, but we also get foreshadowing. We get that all of the bodies, all of the bodies meld into the ground. Basically the opposite of the mechanic that we are going to see in the final fight. All the bodies meld into the ground. So we get one handful of gold. Who fucking cares? What we get more of is foreshadowing. We get narrative. <laughs> so that is our that is our real reward. Uh, for success. Then by the time that you get to ward renewal and they see this mechanic happen, they know that there's more than four skeletons waiting for them at the at the end. Um, ooh, I like that. Okay. So let's put this all into Obsidian now. So in Obsidian, there is basically um, Thicket, Thieves, Succeed... At which point, uh, they they make off with the carriage, but dump the MacGuffin as it's too heavy. Um, as it's too heavy, the PCs have to lug the MacGuffin manually. And need to split four stress amongst them however they see fit. Otherwise, Thicket Thieves die. <laughs> if I learn nothing else from you, Mega, I think I will retain smells, versatility, ver verticality, and foreshadowing. What more do you need? <laughs> What more do you need? Honestly, I wish I was better at verticality. Verticality is like a it's 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 like a um it is the thing that I want, that I aspire to. Uh I do I do try to work in smells and foreshadowing a lot. Foreshadowing is probably the thing that I am that I think is the best and that I am the best at. Um but those other two are aspirational for sure. <laughs> What more do you need, though? Well, especially 
One of the things I'm really considering with this foreshadowing step is reminding myself constantly that the thicket, uh, the thickle, the, the, the thistle, what, what are they? The thistle born? The thistle folk? The thistle folk are not the main feature. The Strix wolves are not the main feature. Hush is not the main feature. The main feature is the Sablewood. So when we're giving narrative clues, when we're talking about things, when we're learning things, they should be within the context of learning about the Sablewood. That's what I'm thinking about throughout this. Now, I'm not saying that's right. <laughs> if you want one of these things, if you want the hybrid animals to be more of a feature within your thing, you should be giving out different clues, you should be reflavoring things, you should be thinking about things differently. But I am thinking about, for my one shot, for my version of this one shot, the, th the Sablewood is the character. It is the thing that is at the centerpiece of all of this. So, when the when they die, the reward that I'm giving is information about the Sablewood. Um, anyways. <laughs> so, we've done it. We have been ambushed. Now, Act 3. Oh, wait. I still need to put the uh, the failure state. Uh, this little uh, thicket thieves die. Uh, party can search the bodies for one handful of gold oh actually oh before that um start a four o'clock four o'clock that is uh visible to the party but is not named uh after the four clock expires the bodies baddies the baddies the bodies are absorbed into the ground all right all righty so seeking an arcanist arrival in hush read the following aloud the path leads you into the forest until you spot a large stone pillar Carve top to bottom in ancient dwarven symbols. This, denote, this denotes one corner of the peaceful village of Hush. When you pass beyond the stone marker, you feel a small sensation, like the pop of a bubble. Then the sounds of friendly chatter become louder. Through the trees of the sable, though the trees of the sablewood are unchanged here, there is a distinctive, safe, and comforting air. A few smiling faces turn to you as your carriage rolls in, waving or casting warm greeting toward the party. There is lively music drifting your direction from the tavern at the center of town. You know you need to find the Whitefire Arcanist to deliver the package from the king. What would you like to do? <laughs> Cue cries of, oh no, we didn't finish looting them. Precisely, AKL. <laughs> and even this, this arrival in Hush, Hush itself is sort of defined by the Sablewood. Like, the fact that they need this fucking, like, noise suppression field is distinctly defining the, uh, like, is, like, distinctly defining the, um, characteristics of the Sablewood almost rather than Hush. That is very interesting. If the players would like to talk to an NPC, you can choose from one of the options below. I can't wait for an app for PCs like D&D Beyond. Well, Irish Thomas, let me show you. Let me show you something. Uh, I'm reading all of this on uh, Demiplane. And Demiplane does have a character creation menu. So I've made uh, I've made two characters so far. The uh, I made a I made a Samaya Rogue, uh, Syndicate Rogue. Um, so yeah. They they have a uh, this this entire like demi plane site is is very uh, D and D beyond. Honestly, I mean you know not I'm not meaning to uh, necessarily talk shit on D and D beyond, but I'm kind of liking it more personally. Um, but but yeah, demi plane, very cool. 
Um, during their discussion... Okay, so we have... They can choose from one of the options below. Oh, Wildborn Dwarf. I see, I see. During their discussion... Oh! Bear small scratches... Okay, no, never mind. Um, choose an additional NPC from the list above. The second will be a friend that has knowledge of where the wild white fire arcanist lives. Um, Demi playing, go look into that for sure. Hell yeah, I I like I like Demi playing a lot. Um, they last saw this person at the tavern and sends you in its direction. For example, your PCs might meet Fidget in town. After some conversations and coaxing, Fidget points the party to the tavern to meet Lausa, Lausa Stolwind. Um. Made by a lot of the same people, I believe. Oh, really? I didn't realize that. Um, the so we yeah so we get some some uh, pushing, and I think that in terms of like what we should plan for, right? In terms of what we should plan for, I think it is absolutely reasonable, and I think that this module is spot on that they'll just want to talk to somebody. <laughs> I think honestly. Do, 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 do. Uh, if you uh, if you are trying to plan this out, you plan out NPC route and the just non NPC route, <laughs> right? Those are kind of the two routes I'm thinking of because an npc route is so like kind of clear and obvious i think um <laughs> now i will say there are some ways that we can anticipate the non npc route and the npc route you know is pretty detailed within the book itself so i'm not too worried about that so for beat 3 we're going the NPC route. Uh, pretty detailed in the book. Not too much needed. For the non-NPC route, we just want to decide some things. You know, we just want to decide some things. Uh, non-NPC route. So we just have a few facts that we should keep in uh, on, on the top of our head. Number one, Arcanist lives in a tree house. So relatively visible from a long distance. On top of that, the tree house glows. <laughs> Beyond that, I don't think it's explicitly stated where the tree house is actually located. So you make your way past the homes of the village, then the farmlands, you see a variety of crops, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You notice the sablewood trees have hundreds of unique faces carved into every side. Uh, one tree taller than the rest bears the Arcanist home like an overripe fruit. It does not specify where the Whitefire Arcanist treehouse is, but given that she is like the leader of their religious order, that she like built the... Um, the borders of the town, presumably. Actually, not presumably. It says later during um, the ward renewal that she made the pillars that actually make Hush quiet. I think it is very reasonable to assume that beyond that, we could assume that her house is in the center of the four Hush uh, totems. So not necessarily the center of the village. That's the, you know, that's the, um, the clover, um, tavern, but we could assume that her house is in the center of the hush totems. And so they could maybe logic that out. That's maybe a, a route to get there. Um, Demiplane is the creation of the people that created D&D Beyond, Adam Bradford et al. Before it was sold to Has Broken, Wizards of the Coast, and any meaningful updates beyond digital dice ceased. Woof. <laughs> That's crazy. 
Uh, we avoid any townspeople because the Strix Wolf Cub we just adopted gets nervous around strangers. Also, we are super ashamed of having lots of the met of having lots of the magic carriage. I mean, honestly, dude. So we're just trying to predict some potential routes, some potential clues that we could give them if they ask. It's visible from a long distance. It fucking glows. And we could assume that her thing is relatively in the center of the hush totems. Those are kind of three clues that we could use. Beyond that, uh, maybe there is some... Nah, there wouldn't be a signpost. This is a pretty tight-knit community. Um, I'm trying to think of any other ways that we could get them there where they're not talking to anybody. Hmm. The whole noise suppression field seems hella sus. We don't trust nobody here. I mean, honestly, yeah. You have to you have to think about like and that's why I'm saying like I think the NPC route is very probable, but there are distinct reasons that they may not want to talk to any of the NPCs or they may not trust the NPCs information. So they might want other factors to lead them Um, if none of the above work, the MacGuffin, the MacGuffin upon examination could be slightly, almost imperceptibly pulled in the direction of the Arcanist as the primary, actually, ooh, something that we could do. It might not even be the Arcanist. It could be in the uh, direction of the Open Veil. The Open Veil is like the place of power nearby. It's where the Arcanist brings you in order to, um, in order to basically reinfuse the the rune stone that you're carrying, the MacGuffin. So what you could do is you could have it be pulled in the direction of the open veil as the nearby place of power. Uh, the uh, the the route to the open veil just so happens to pass near-ish to the treehouse. Definitely where it would be in view. So then if they choose to just, you know, skip the Arcanist altogether, they might go to the Open Veil first, they might get confused, they might then go back to the Arcanist. But you can at least... If they go this direction, if they go like the magical compass direction, uh, you can at least introduce the generalized location of the treehouse, and then they might come back to it later. So I think these are, I think this is about enough uh, potential predictive measures for the non NPC route. Um, yeah, we just need a, a few contingencies. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, all right, seeking an arcanist. All right, so we have these NPCs. I might practice a few voices off stream for them, might not. Who knows? I don't know. At least some, uh, maybe some mannerisms for them, especially fidget. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then the Clover Tavern. The Clover Tavern is a site to behold with six curving stories climbing the trunk of the ancient tree this is the heart of the community always crowded with music and good-natured conversation newcomers to the bar must take off their shoes and hang them over a line that stretches around the bar's ground floor inevitably by the time the visitors leave their shoes will be shined and filled with small trinkets as you enter what would you like to do let the players role play, introduce them to the barkeep or a friendly local who asks them to hang their shoes on the line. Let them explore the different levels of the tavern. If you feel comfortable, ask some of your players to participate in describing details about it, which we talked about this earlier. And there's an optional ooh, 
the first Frost Moss Festival. If they ask around, the PCs will find out the people of Hush are currently celebrating the first, the, wait, the first Moss, not the Frost Moss, the first Moss uh, Festival. The time when new crops in the sunless farms have the first layer of moss growing upon them, meaning they're beginning to ripen for the season. It's a celebration of the arrival of spring and the abundance of fresh fruits and vegetables the town will soon have. There is a good-natured arm wrestling competition, a stone painting class, and a small marketplace full of homemade trinkets. That's fun. I like that. I like little, little fun festivals, especially... The arm wrestling competitions, the stone painting class, the homemade trinkets, like, they could absolutely use the trinkets or the stone painting class to give to the Arcanist later on. Um, like, this is, yeah, that's really cool. That's really fun. I like that. I am probably going to uh, keep that in mind for my, for my uh, run. Uh, when you're ready, guide the players in finding an NPC who will help them. If they bypassed asking someone in town, just use one of the NPCs from the list here instead. After a few exchanges, you can have the NPC say something like, <clears throat> The Arcanist is quite busy, but you've traveled so far. I'm sure she'll be more than hospitable. We would be lost without her. She keeps this whole place under a powerful ward so that no dangers from the Sablewood can pass into town. You'll find her house to the south. Through the farmland, it's hanging from one of the old Sablewood trees. You can't miss it. When the PCs are ready, set them off towards the Arcanist. Dun dun dun! The Treehouse, part four, or act four. So, pretty, pretty easy, pretty simple. We have the NPC, the non-NPC routing, and we get back to number four we don't really need any benefits or uh we, we yeah i don't think we really need any 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 benefits or um downsides between this um very rivendell uh loth lothlorian ring ward idols i am not aware with either of those uh those fantasy i recognize loth uh loth and i i recognize rivendell as well but I'm not familiar with either of the settings. It's cool though. It does sound very interesting to me. It um, it, it feels almost reminiscent of uh, what do you call it? Sunless seas. A little bit less like Lovecraftian. A little bit less like Eldritch horror than like Sunless Seas. But it, it has almost that kind of vibe to me. Um. Anyways, so we get to uh, number four. This is what I would call, um, if we go back, if you guys have seen my how to make a map, which I need to make it into a long so that it's more consumable. But if we're talking about like how to make a map, right? We have an interesting point at first. So we have an interesting point with the Strix Wolf. Then we have an obstacle. Then we have what I would call a neutral point. And you need these. You need neutral points like number three to break up the space in between the points. And then we're going to go back to another interesting point with the Arcanist. And then we're going to have one final obstacle before the end of the session and i think that this is a totally fine uh pacing for a um for a one shot you have something interesting you have an obstacle you have a breather you have something interesting and then you have the final obstacle seems like a totally fair way to pace uh, a singular session or a singular one shot um so yeah, that is absolutely how I am planning on running this. Obviously, there could still be skill checks. There could still be consequences. But all in all, we want Hush to feel like a little bit of a breather um, from what they just went through. From Lord of the Rings. Oh, Elrond and Galadriel both had rings of power, which they used to create gated neighborhoods as the world slowly decayed around them. Slightly cynical. Interesting. Huh. Very interesting, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, making your way past the homes of the village, then through the farmlands of Hush. 
You can see a variety of crops that have begun to cultivate a thin layer of glowing blue moss over the top of their fruits and vegetables. They pulse softly like a heartbeat as you passed. Among the thriving groves, you notice that the sablewood trees in this area have hundreds of unique faces carved into all sides, the eyes peering in every direction. One tree, taller than the rest, bears the arcanist home like an overripe fruit. It hangs from a braid of rope as, the, as wide around as a giant's forearm, tied to a massive branch and counterweighted by a cabin-sized boulder lying at the base of the tree. The stone is marked with a collection of symbols, and the cabin windows flash with a soft yellow-green light. What would you like to do? Cool. <laughs> Are you going to be streaming this one shot? Um, I don't know yet. I need to talk to the players um, because most of the players, actually all, well, some of the players have streamed, but they are primarily like long and shorts creators. Um, so I don't know if they would want to do it offline, if they would want to do it streamed like live. Um, there will be a VOD of it no matter what. Potentially edited, potentially not. We'll see. But there will be some sort of public uh, uh, viewing experience of it uh, at some point. Um, yeah. So for this treehouse, give the player the options to role play and problem solve. Uh, problem solve. Use the section below as guidance or create your own. If they try to call to the Arcanist from below, there is no response, but the light within still flickers. Okay. If they try to cut the counterweight rope, it will immediately blast them backward a few feet, dealing a point of stress. Get fucked. Um, <laughs> if they try to climb the tree, it's an agility roll with a difficulty of 13. On a failure, a limb of the tree grabs them, gently sets them down on the forest floor, which then resumes its original form. Okay. When they finally do something to successfully get the Arcanist's attention, use the following to describe her as she emerges from her cabin to greet them. That's so interesting that it doesn't describe anything that's like a guaranteed success. It's just, hey, climb the tree. It's a kind of a tough agility roll. But, you know, you could just bash your head against it. This is very much something that I'll have to think about. Although this is also kind of something where the objective is so clear and obvious. And because we have stress as a downside, I don't really feel like I need to prep that much for it. I feel like I can pretty easily just uh, improv this part of it. Of like setting DCs on the fly and setting uh, downsides to it on the fly. There's because they won't all be that different. They will all be something related to the tree and they are all exploration type deals. So I feel like it'll be pretty easy to just give them either uh, damage consequences or stress consequences. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm just not going to prep anything for that. And I mean, that's part of my prep style is um, knowing when to do and when to not, uh, you know. That sounds like a fun pastime for local kids climbing the tree. That does. <laughs> it really does. Yeah, just climb the tree, see how high you can get, and it'll always, like, catch you and uh, and take you back down. That is really fun. Uh, uh, a seven foot... And honestly, if you wanted to work that into your description, you could even have a couple of local kids already doing that when you roll up. <laughs> That could be really fun if you wanted to uh, describe the members or the, the inhabitants of Hush as a bit more, um, not trustworthy, but like lighthearted and you wanted to uh, to show them just kind of goofing off and having fun. That could be really fun. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, <laughs> that NPC kid from, could mention it or there could be kids there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Especially if they, if they do really well at talking uh, to them. Like if if they really uh like like really make friends with Fidget, it, they could absolutely tell them about the Arcanist tree. I like the thought of kids betting each other to see how far they can get. Yeah, that's super fun. I agree. 
Yeah. Uh, okay, so the Arcanist, a seven, seven foot, holy fuck, a seven foot mix of humanoid and firefly. The Arcanist is a fairy that moves in a combination of both very slow and suddenly jerky motions. Though her expressions are difficult to read, her emotions are very clear in her voice. She is old but spry and eyes the group mischievously. Are you the group Emerus sent from the capital? Oh my, you're rather late, aren't you? Come in, come in. <laughs> I don't have a good old person voice. I don't have good voices in general. Uh-oh. <laughs> but I do my best. As the Arcanist lowers her home and invites you inside, you'll notice the treehouse is surprisingly spacious. TARDIS situation the main probably not um the main room is a crowd of potion bottles spell books runes plants and small creatures of all kinds but no one could classify this place as messy it's clear that if anyone moved a single item even an inch the old fairy would notice sort of like your uncle's like shed where like all of the tools have like a fucking like line around them so that you know which like peg they hang on that's sort of the vibe I'm, uh, I'm, I'm getting there. Yeah. Um, I loved the very casual. Oh, wait, what? Oh, wait, let's see. Let's see. The package. Okay. Uh, le, 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 le. Let the players role play with the Arcanist. Make her curious about their journey. The NPC who directed them towards their house and how each of them might have imagined they might die one day. <laughs> Well, that's pretty good. I like that, too. I like that a lot. <laughs> Once she's had enough conversation, the Arcanist will ask about the package from King Emerus in order to inspect it uh, in safety. She will magically unfold her home as if it were blo a blossoming flower. She'll hurry the players to get the crate inside before closing the cabin back up, now just a bit bigger. <laughs> when she opens the delivery... Uh, read the below aloud. This is very interesting. It's, like, very, like, soft magic, which is very interesting to have in this sort of game that has, you know, these distinct magical, like, grimoires and spells and cards. This sounds very, like, Lord of the Rings soft magic-esque, uh, which is, which is interesting. I don't, I don't hate it. I don't like it. I, 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 I'm, I'm very neutral on it. It's very... I'll have to think about it a, a little bit more. I guess it's supposed to, like, the softer the magic, the more powerful they are, I suppose. To a degree, at least. Let's see. Inside King Emerus's package lies a massive stone with a lion's face carved into it. Marlo, you recognize this as the keystone of the capital city gate's main archway. The Arcanist nods sagely as soon as she sees it, saying, Of course the king would keep this delivery a secret. Oh, man. I'm really going to have to work on the Arcanist voice. I think that's going to be the most important one. And I don't know. Oh, I'm old. <laughs> if anyone knew your city was no longer watered, you would have been conquered before sunrise. Oh, no. That's not it. That's not it at all. Oh, okay. Well, we'll see. I'll practice. With this ominous warning, she starts to unfurl her treehouse yet again. You must travel to the open veil to reinstate the ward, but such an effort of magic will attract dangerous creatures from the darkest reaches of the Sablewood. I'll need your help. <laughs> There's a general fairy tale vibe here which fits with conceptual magic. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Maybe more Narnia than Middle Earth. Yeah, I see that. I see that. I think more elegant and ethereal rather than old. Yeah, very and more. Of course, the king would keep this delivery a secret. If anyone knew your city was no longer walled. Yeah, something along there. More Judge Judy Dench as M. <laughs> I see that, yeah. I'll have to work on it. I'll workshop it. I need a, a physicality to tie to it. Because this, this is not it. That is, this is not it. This is a little bit more it, I think. I need to, I need to get the physicality, though, because she's very, she's very tall, very precise, but she's also slow, but also erratic. So it's like, of course the king would keep this delivery a secret. If anyone knew your city was no longer warded, you 
would be conquered before sunrise. We must travel to the open veil to reinstate the ward, but such an effort of magic will attract a ding creatures from the darkest reaches of the sable wood. I'll need your help. There, I, I think maybe that's uh, that's the more specific thing to latch on to. Because anyone can be old, right? But the, uh, the description of her both going a combination of both very slow and suddenly jerky... I think is a little bit more evocative of her character. It makes her a little bit more distinct. And capturing that in her narration could be good. Eh, gives Tilda Swinton vibes. <laughs> I'm down with that. Uh, yeah, I'll have to think about that more. Anyways, if the players seem enthusiastic about helping, you should cut straight to the open veil, transitioning into Act 5. Otherwise, you can encourage the players to describe their time traveling with the eccentric white fire arcanist. The World Renewal. On direction from the arcanist, your carriage pulls into a mysterious clearing in the shape of a perfect circle. The only area of the Sablewood you've seen without trees to block out the sky. This is the Open Veil. Speak to the players as the Arcanist, describing the Open Veil as a place used for strong ritual magic. It is where she first forged the Ward Pillars that reside on all four corners of Hush, keeping the village safe. She almost died in that ritual, but is reluctant to say more for fear of angering the Forgotten God. Engage the PCs in conversation. Then, when you're ready, read the following. Or even Emma Thompson as Professor Tre uh, Trelawney in Harry Potter. Yeah, Professor Trelawney is a good comparison. I think that is very much what I kind of picture there. Yeah, I like that. Be a very good reference for this type of character. Yeah, I agree. I agree. There's always the Dowager Countess of Grantham, Downton Abbey, for old enough to give zero fucks. <laughs> that is also a, a very distinct vibe here. I agree. <laughs> okay. So, read the following. The Arcanus antenna perk up in a disconcerting way. This is good. Stop, stop. Yes. Here. Now, come help me. I'm old. <laughs> this time she unfolds the carriage as she did with her home and stands over the crate, humming. Her body starts to glow brighter, flickering in the night. I will need an hour of time to prepare. You all enjoy the night air while you can. We'll be busy very soon. A short rest. Tell the PCs that they will now take a short rest. Uh, they cannot do the same option twice. Tend to wounds, clear stress, repair armor, propel. Ancient skeleton battle guide. So let's think about this. This seems pretty straightforward. There does not seem to be a lot that they can really fuck up when it comes to interacting with the Arcanist, right? And I'm tempted to just leave it that way, you know? I think it's just like lore shit. I will say, if you were making a more, um, if this was within the context of a larger campaign, I would have multiple things that the Arcanist knows um, that would maybe, you know, represent some branching paths here on this. So, like, they find out about that ritual that she mentioned, right? The one where she almost died. Like, okay, they, they get information about the ritual, Maybe here they get information about the Sablewood. Here they get information about the Forgotten Gods. Right? That's something that you can do with this sort of wise old, P uh, you know, not player character, NPC. Something that I'm not as concerned with here. You know, again, for within the context of me running a one-shot, I'm not as concerned about these branching paths. There's maybe some fun things that you could do for the branching paths, but it's not something that I feel like I need to prep. I feel like there's enough interesting stuff here without prepping it, and the more we prep out, ugh, the longer our shit's gonna be, right? <laughs> so I'm willing to let this be a straight fucking line. 
over to five. Uh, and then five is uh, the ritual begins. So let's see. Let's think about this combat a little bit. Oh, wait. Ancient skeleton battle guide. Wait, wait, wait. Because the skeletons have no attack modifier, roll a d20 to ask if it hits the target's evasion. On a success, deal 3d6 plus 2 physical. If the ancient skeletons take 7 or less damage, they mark 1 hit point. Otherwise, they drop. Where's their stat block? Ancient skeletons. Oh, yeah, they only have 2 HP. They only have 2 HP. So if they take 7 or less, you know, they take half their HP. If they take a major, that's 2 HP, so they're down. That's so interesting. Yeah, they're like little one hits. That's very, very interesting. Okay. Uh, la, 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 la. You can spend one action token to activate their group attack. Moving all skeletons in close range of a target into melee and immediately dealing five damage each. This does not require an attack roll, but uses up all their activations. Holy fuck, that's deadly. Huh. Okay. So you have to spend a fear. What does close five mean? I think that's on the adversaries page, right? Uh, la, 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 la. Overview, GM's new Daggerheart, Court Guidance, Mechanics, Adversaries. Let's see. I want to see. So this is group attack range and then X. What is the X in this case? The group can move and make an attack against the target. On a success, they deal X amount of damage per adversary. Okay. That makes sense. But you only have to spend one token it does use up all of their activations and it uses a fear but it's one action token that's i see okay understood um we'll have to see how that goes i can see this being a dangerous encounter but this will this is why i'm really wanting to run this so much for myself is because like i read that and i'm like oh my god how am i not going to insta kill them <laughs> but i guess ultimately i can only do three damage at a time but still you know um all right the ritual begins read the following aloud the arcanist lets out a shrill cry the keystone has finally responded quickly surround me the ritual must begin or i'll lose the pathway hurry <laughs> Her body begins to glow brighter and brighter still as her eyes roll backwards into her head and the entire carriage lifts a foot off the ground. Wait a second. <laughs> Matt just did this in the Critical Role episode that we just watched. Fucking Gilmore's body lifted a foot off the ground. <laughs> Do you think that he might have had any involvement in this describing? <laughs> Oh, that's, that's obviously a very classic trope. Um, an unearthly cry echoes from the woods, alerted by the arcane energy. Okay. Surely not. Then, place the white fire arcanist standee at the center of the table. Ask the players to also place their standees in the scene. Finally, place four ancient skeletons within close range of the arcanist and two forest wraiths within far range. Then read the following aloud. You feel a rumble as four ancient skeletons emerge from the ground, rusted swords in hand, disturbed by the forces of magic used by the arcanist. In the distance, two forest wraiths ominously to float ominously towards you. I'm going to start a countdown die for the ritual. Your goal is to hold off the enemies until her work is complete. Let's see. Grab a D8 and send it to the 8 side. This is a countdown die. It will tick down one number every time an adversary is taken down. I didn't read that part. I read. I knew there was a countdown die in this segment, but I didn't re uh, read that it's every time an adversary is taken down. I think. I think that's good. I like that as the basis for it. I like that as the basis for the countdown. That's cool. Um, <laughs> what up, Hyacanth? Yeah, we're, we're nearing the end. I actually think it's going to be a relatively short stream, you know, on the order of my streams. It'll be, you know, less than four hours. Um, also, my voice is, is starting to give on me a little bit. And I have some 
some tasks I need to do. Um, but yeah, we're almost we're almost done. We're almost through. But it's been very good. It's been very productive. I think. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. It will tick up every time the white fire arcanist is hit with an attack. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. It counts up when she's hit, and it counts down when you take out an adversary. It gives a very tug-of-war feel to this. And it's also, every time she's hit, it doesn't specify how much she's hit for. Um, oh, that's super cool. I like that a lot. That's a good use of it, I think. When the countdown reaches zero, the ritual is complete, and the fight will end. Yeah. Absolutely. Because I'm assuming the Arcanist will just fucking destroy anyone who gets in her way. So the moment that the ritual is done, you know, she's gone. But that does also mean that you have to defeat eight adversaries, assuming she takes no damage. So there is an interesting strategic thing here of like, how much do you defend her? How much do you not defend her? I'm also curious, unlike... Unlike the uh, other one where we had the goal, right? We had the goal for the Thistle Folk of this is what they are trying to do. Do we have that with these people? The the ancient skeletons, right? Let, let me see the details page. Yeah, I got no, I got no uh, motivations for these. That's I don't know about that. Uh, let me see. Let me see if there's a different adversary page. So let's say Skeleton Warrior. What's their motivation? Motivation and tactics. Gang up, feign death, steal skin. Whoa, that's crazy. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so this is a little bit interesting. We'll have to kind of suss out, like, what do we think the skeleton's goals are? They're being drawn by the Arcanist magic, and... Kind of the conceit of the fight is that every time she gets hit, like the skeleton, uh, like the the thing delays. So that would imply that they're trying to hit her, right? That would that would that would imply it to me. But it's how intelligently do we want to run these ancient skeletons? What do they have that sort of stat block? No, they don't. Yeah, they don't even have like a a good a good thing for me to base their intelligence off of, you know? Or their strats. You only start with six, so you need to bring out two more. Either Skellies or the Wraiths. Yeah, you need to bring out at least two more. Yeah, you're right. You're right. They're basically tools of the darker forces of the Sablewoods itself. I think those guys are just mooks. Yeah. Yeah, so it's trying to d debate, are they just going to mindlessly go after the Arcanist? Are they going to get distracted by the PCs? Like, that's the real thing I have, you know, we kind of have to decide here is what are their goals? They're, I think their ultimate goal is to stop the Arcanist, but how much are we going to be able to distract them? from their main goal. Because that would keep it safer for the PCs, but obviously more dangerous for the Arcanist. But the only downside to the Arcanist getting hit, really, because I don't think she has a stat block, does she? Let's see. Does, she, does the Arcanist actually have it? Like, could the Arcanist die, and could they fail? That is my main curiosity right now. I don't think she even has a stat block. It just says place the white fire arcanist standee. I mean, you could assume some sort of stat block, but basically we have to weigh like what is fun and like what makes sense here. Because I think what makes sense here is for all of the uh, enemies to bum rush the white fire arcanist and to basically just hit her over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and that will make this combat a fucking slog. <laughs> but I do think that that's probably what makes the most sense internally. So 
So we're going to have to see how much can we divert from what makes sense to replace that with what is fun. <laughs> Might depend on how many players you're running this with. If I had a full complement of five, I think I'd like for them to all go for the Arcanist. Potentially. And that is an aspect of I am going with three players. Let's see more of this. Let's see more of this. Let's see if they have maybe something here about it. Encounters can have their own fear moves that let you spend fear in a unique way. For this encounter, you'll have one called Vengeance of the Veil. Uh, spend a fear to call forth two additional skeletons from the ground within close range of the carriage. Add two tokens to the art action tracker. Forest Wraith Battle Guide. Forest Wraiths can attack from far range with a plus three attack modifier. On a success, they deal two, 1d10 plus four magic damage. They have resistance to physical, meaning any incoming physical damage is cut in half, rounded up. Interesting. Their memory delve makes the target vulnerable, which means all rolls you make against them are an advantage. This condition doesn't stack, so it's best to use this once per PC. Pass through should be used. Pass through. Pass through. Should be used sparingly to avoid incapacitating the whole party at once. Because this move knocks a PC out of their body and stops them from acting until an adversary is taken down. Using the Vengeance of the Veil and Counter move can be a useful way to generate new, easily defeatable adversaries to avoid this from happening. Damn. They have to give you advice on how to not accidentally TPK with the Forest Wraiths. Wait, let me see. To fear and make an attack roll against a target in melee. On success, the Forest Wraith passes through the body, pushing their soul from their body. They cannot act again until the ritual countdown ticks down one value. Zam. That's kind of wacky. <laughs> Holy shit, dude. <laughs> if some of the skeletons are the thistle folk from before, then it would make it personal. That's true. You make like half of these the rando skellos, and you have half of these be uh, the thistle folk skellos. And so the Thistlefolk ones go after the party, and the other ones go after the Arcanist. That's not bad. That's not bad at all. It does say ancient skeletons, but meh. Oh. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, you are right that it does say ancient skeletons, but I also think it's more fun if the baddies from before reappear. I think that's that's cooler. Uh, again, this is probably written for newbies with me. No, I'm not even saying it's funny that they have to guide you through it. It is funny that the forest raves have an ability that is so powerful that you might just accidentally TPK if you're not careful. <laughs> it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's reminiscent of like the shadow, like the shadow's strength drain or an, in, or an intellect devourer's intelligence drain where it's like, uh oh, if you're not careful enough, you might just... <laughs> You might just kill some people. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, that's that's funny. Yeah. I'm more laughing at the uh, the design of the enemy, you know? <laughs> hmm. Hmm. That's for the player who won't let others play. You just say, bam, go to the Shadow Realm. <laughs> you look at the person who has the most... You know what? Karen, you, you joke, but I also think you're putting a kernel of truth in there. Because we talked about it at the beginning, you know. The action tracker does allow you to see who has been acting more and who has been acting less. So if I'm looking at this action tracker, I am absolutely not targeting A with uh, with pass through. But I am maybe, you know, if it's B and C, if they have seven and eight, maybe that's a little bit different. But if they have like seven, three, and one, it actually might make a lot of sense to target C with your pass through ability. That's really not a bad point, honestly. For your general GM tactics during this fight. Because the Forest Wraiths, you know, inhabiting the, um, the, you know, the Forest Wraith mindset, they probably have no distinction between who they're passing through. 
they probably don't really care that much. So then let's talk about, you know, our GM voice. If C has taken seven actions so far and A and B have only taken a total of four, you pass through C. You give the other two a bit of a chance to shine. That's a good fucking point, honestly. <laughs> Must be a challenge to write a suggested test module like this so that it will keep the interest of more experienced player and GMs as well as a fairly as well as be fairly idiot proof. I agree. Writing one shots, I think, is one of the hardest things to do. I'm terrible at it. We talked about that during the Vassal High Mark of like I am bad at writing one shots. I can't even imagine writing a one shot for public audience and like for public consumption it would have to be it, it, it has to be so fucking hard dude <laughs> i just finished building out my one shot for sunday and i need to test the encounters because mm, <laughs> yeah there's this this encounter could be very deadly and very boring on accident but i think it's a solid construct like i i really i see the good bones there i'll have to think about it a little bit more off screen maybe fishbowl it a little bit well the forest rays have a crazy amount of hp and crazy fucking damage thresholds zam that's a lot but the ancient skeletons have fucking two so that makes sense <laughs> will you keep the NPC? um the the NPC they tell us to absolutely keep. I meant the player character. Do they tell you to absolutely keep one? Uh-oh. <laughs> I don't remember that. There are five pre-gen. Uh, the GM should read the options of the players and have them take four page character packets. Oh. Marlo must be played during this adventure. I see. The personal mage to King Emerus and is responsible for bringing this group together. She appears calm until she isn't. You know, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> mm. Oh my gosh, thank you, AKL. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for the gifts. Oh, I don't know if I just can't see it's not processing or if it's just not, but thank you. Either way, thank you so much. Um, Yeah, man. I don't know. I'll have to talk to my players about Marlo. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I think uh, there's an aspect. I understand why they tell you that she must be played. At least if you're inhabiting the rest of these characters. I think if you're playing custom characters, you can just keep Marlo in mind and maybe, you know, flex one of your other characters into Marlo's role. You know what I'm saying? Um... Basically, anything with 3 HPs gets nuked. Yeah, at least has the chance to get nuked. And, I mean, 2 HP with a major threshold of 8, there's a very good shot that these are getting one hit. Absolutely good chance. So, yeah, I I am... Uh, it's very interesting. I will... I'm so excited to see how it plays. I'm so excited. I'm almost... I'm, I'm, I'm not... I don't want to change the combat at all. Um, the, my only, not concern, but it's just like, how will I run target priority is my main concern. How will I run the target priority of the ancient skeletons in the forest wraiths? I really liked that in the thicket thieves, they gave you a distinct goal. I think that's awesome. Uh, I kind of wish they gave you that in ward renewal. I kind of wish they gave you the goal cause they gave you a battle guide they give you a strategy, which, you know, makes total sense, but they don't give you a goal at all, which I think, uh, which I think is, is kind of sad. Um, having gone through it, Marlo doesn't seem that vital. She's not vital. Really could be turned into an NPC. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember one time where they mentioned Marlo. Um, I don't even remember where it was. Yeah, I feel like at one point they mentioned Marlo. You basically have to have a reason that the PCs are the ones doing this. But other than that, I don't think she seems that, yeah, that that important. Uh, is Marlo a paladin babysitter archetype? It's kind of seems like. I don't know. Let's see. Marlo Fairwind. 
Uh, personal mage to King Emrys and responsible for, for bringing the group together. I trust you with my life. I once considered you close. I owe you a favor. Oh, interesting. She's Loreborn. She's an elf. She's a primal origin sorcerer. Royal mage and not on my watch. Interesting. Why do you think King Emrys trusts you more than anyone else to deliver this package? I mean, I think, honestly, the only thing you need out of Marlowe's is this question. I think this is the main question that you have to, that someone has to answer, is why does King Emrys trust you? I honestly think if you answer this question, you're kind of chilling on Marlowe. You know what I mean? Um, She could have waved them off before they entered the Sandwood. Also true, yeah. Yeah, Marlo recognized the MacGuffin as the Keystone, so someone needs to be familiar with the city, basically, or the Arcanist could just tell them. Yeah, also that. Because uh, they banging. Marlo is hot. <laughs> that's that's very fair. <laughs> that's why you need her. Uh, <laughs> and there needs to be a reason for the king to have charged them with this. Yeah. I think you basically need someone, like, like AKL said, you need someone familiar with the city, and you need to answer this question. I think beyond that, you're chilling. I trust, uh, he trusts a girl who wants to skip leg day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. Yeah, shit, I think we're good. We really didn't need to take many notes past four. Like, past four, you're kind of just on the trail that you need to go down. And there's not much deviation that's gonna happen. The only thing that I need to note for myself is for... Uh, four... Follow book <laughs> and for five, consider targeting priority to make sure that the combat doesn't drag, uh, but also isn't accidentally too deadly. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, you start in, in around the body of your fallen comrade companion, Marlo. Her last request was plot hook. Yeah, that could work. That could absolutely work. Yeah. Oh, uh, all right. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. We got some prep for Daggerheart done. All right. Sick. I think that's going to be it. Not to, uh, you know, cut off the stream unduly soon, but I'd love to be able to save my voice a little bit, and, you know, I, uh, I think that that was, uh, that was pretty solid. My, my fucking brightness looks off. I rem I think it was because this was, yeah, there we go, that's a little bit better. Um, that was fun, though. The last was a Marlo or Tell King Emrys, nuh <laughs> Now what do we do? I just got here. I know, Little Hill. You're you're normally used to me uh, doing five hour streams, so you can get here three hours late, and you're all good. Uh, <laughs> I am considering potentially a stream later tonight. I don't want to guarantee it though. I got a lot of shit to do. Um, but. I'm hopeful it'll be good shit. I, I have some editing stuff I'm going to take care of. Some some of the thumbnail things that we talked about. Making the coding environment stream safe. I've got some, I've got some ideas. I've also... Uh, I'm also considering something for Critical Role. Another schedule change. Uh-oh. <laughs> But we're going to have to test it. I will I will tell you right now, one of the things I'm considering is potentially doing two full episodes a week instead of one full episode and two half eps. Partially so that more people in more time zones can catch Critical Role and so that Critical Role doesn't take up three out of my five days. But I am making, I am thinking about that in terms of how last full episode went where it was actually like relatively consumable. Um, 
and I need to see if I can consistently make that happen before I consider doing two full episodes a week. I need to really make sure that I can consistently nail that. Um, but we'll see. I, I don't think that'll happen if it does happen. It might not happen at all. And if it does, it might, it'll might it probably be in like two or three weeks. So it's just something I'm thinking about. So that we can potentially get like more days of Daggerheart, more days of Baldur's Gate, more days of Minecraft, um, coding streams, things like that. Because right now Critical Role is three of the streams a week, but I also don't want to take away any of those in terms of the content we get through because I don't want to slow the pace on Critical Role at all. I want it to be two episodes a week, no matter what. So we'll have to think about it. I don't know. I'm thinking about it. That's one of the other things that I'm going to be considering tonight and talking to people about. But uh, this was so helpful for me specifically. Pretty much perfect. Hell yeah, AKL. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear it. I mean, hey, it was democracy. Democracy voted. <laughs> uh, did you make them choose class already? Or are you going to print everything uh, here? Uh, I am, I'm going to leave it pretty free reign up to them. Uh, the players I'm going to be playing with are DMs. Uh, they're like other content creators. So I'm going to leave it pretty wide open for them on what exactly they do and how they, exactly they go about it. Um, so that... Because uh, I, I trust them to be pretty unconstrained with themselves, you know? Um, tubercular episode Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah, that. Hmm. <laughs> But, anyways, I will see you later. You'll maybe be seeing some longs or some shorts come out soon. You'll maybe see some thumbnails changing. And uh, that'll be that. Um, Tabletop Tuesday. Tabletop Tuesday works. Uh, also, thank you for the sub, Kane. I, I appreciate it. Everyone show up as ribbits. <laughs> In the thistle folk, it's like the Spider-Man pointing meme. Uh... <laughs> Anyways, good short stream. I'll see you tomorrow for uh, Critical Role Friday while it's still around. And that's it.